Uh, James Tyrone will be played by Jim Hill. Hello. Mary Tyrone by Grania Goodwin. Hi. Jamie Tyrone by Christopher Prentice. Hello. Edmund Tyrone by Nick Campos. Hello, everyone, and hello, my love. Kathleen by Ruth Goodwin. Hello. And the stage directions will be read by me, Sean Wilson. Act one. Scene. Living room of James Tyrone's summer home on a morning in August 1912. At rear are two double doorways with portiers. The one at the right leads into a front parlor with the formally arranged set appearance of a room rarely occupied. The other opens on a dark, windowless back parlor, never used except as a passage from living room to dining room. Against the wall between the doorways is a small bookcase with a picture of Shakespeare above it, containing novels by Balzac, Zola, Stendhal, philosophical and sociological works by Schopenhauer, Nietzsche, Marx, Engels, Kropotkin, Max Stirner, plays by Ibsen, Shaw, Strindberg, poetry by Swinburne, Rossetti, Wilde, Ernest, Dowson, Kipling, etc. In the right wall, rear, is a screen door leading out on the porch, which extends halfway around the house. Farther forward, a series of three windows looks over the front lawn to the harbor and the avenue that runs along the waterfront. A small wicker table and an ordinary oak desk are against the wall, flanking the windows. In the left wall, a similar series of windows looks out on the grounds in the back of the house. Beneath them is a wicker couch with cushions, its head toward rear. Farther back is a large, glassed-in bookcase with sets of Dumas, Victor Hugo, Charles Lever, three sets of Shakespeare, the world's best literature in 50 large volumes, Hume's History of England, Veer's History of the Consulate and Empire, Smollett's History of England, Gibbon's Roman Empire and miscellaneous volumes of old plays, poetry, and several histories of Ireland. The astonishing thing about these sets is that all the volumes have the look of having been read and reread. The hardwood floor is nearly covered by a rug, inoffensive in design and color. At center is a round table with a green shaded reading lamp, the cord plugged in of one of the four sockets in the chandelier above. Around the table within reading light range are four chairs, three of them wicker armchairs, the fourth at right front of table, a varnished oak rocker with leather bottom. It is around 8.30. Sunshine comes through the windows at right. As the curtain rises, the family have just finished breakfast. Mary Tyrone and her husband enter together from the back parlor, coming from the living room. Mary is 54, about medium height. She still has a young, graceful figure, a trifle plump, but showing little evidence of middle-aged waist and hips, although she is not tightly corseted. Her face is distinctly Irish in type. It must once have been extremely pretty and is still striking. It does not match her healthy figure, but is thin and pale with the bone structure prominent. Her nose is long and straight, her mouth wide with full, sensitive lips. She uses no rouge or any sort of makeup. Her high forehead is framed by thick, white, pure hair, pure white hair. Accentuated by her pallor and white hair, her dark brown eyes appear black. They are unusually large and beautiful, with black brows and long, curling lashes. What strikes one immediately is her extreme nervousness. Her hands are never still. They were once beautiful hands with long, tapering fingers, but rheumatism has knotted the joints and warped the fingers so that now they have an ugly, crippled look. One avoids looking at them, the more so because one is conscious she is sensitive about their appearance and humiliated by her inability to control the nervousness which draws attention to them. She is dressed simply, but with a sure sense of what becomes her. Her hair is arranged with fastidious care. 
Her voice is soft and attractive. When she is merry, there is a touch of Irish lilt in it. Her most appealing quality is the simple, unaffected charm of a shy convent girl youthfulness she has never lost. An innate, unworldly innocence. James Tyrone is 65, but looks 10 years younger. About five feet eight, broad-shouldered and deep-chested, he seems taller and slenderer because of his bearing, which has a soldierly quality of head up, chest out, stomach in, shoulders squared. His face has begun to break down, but he is still remarkably good-looking. A big, finely shaped head, a handsome profile, deep-set light brown eyes. His gray hair is thin with a bald spot like a monk's tonsure. The stamp of his profession is unmistakably on him. Not that he indulges in any of the deliberate, temperamental posturings of the stage star. He is, by nature and preference, a simple, unpretentious man whose inclinations are still close to his humble beginnings and his Irish farmer forebears. But the actor shows in all his unconscious habits of speech, movement, and gesture. The, these have the quality of belonging to a studied technique. His voice is remarkably fine, resonant and flexible, and he takes great pride in it. His clothes, assuredly, do not costume any romantic part. He wears a threadbare, ready-made gray sack suit and shinless black shoes, shineless black shoes, a collarless shirt with a thick white handkerchief knotted loosely around his throat. There is nothing picturesquely careless about this getup. It is commonplace shabby. He believes in wearing his clothes to the limit of usefulness, is dressed now for gardening, and doesn't give a damn how he looks. He has never been really sick a day in his life. He has no nerves. There is a lot of stolid, earthly peasant in him, mixed with streaks of sentimental melancholy and rare flashes of intuitive sensibility. Tyrone's arm is around his wife's waist as they appear from the back parlor. Entering the living room, he gives her a playful hug. You're a fine armful now, Mary, with those 20 pounds you've gained. Oh, I've gotten too fat, you mean, dear. I really ought to reduce. None of that, my lady. You're just right. We'll have no talk of reducing. Is that why you ate so little breakfast? So little? I thought I ate a lot. You didn't. Not as much as I'd like to see anyway. Oh, you. You expect everyone to eat an enormous breakfast you do. No one else in the world could eat without dying of indigestion. <laughs> I hope I'm not as big a glutton as that sounds. But thank God I've kept my appetite and I have the digestion of a young man of 20, if I am 65. You surely have, James. No one could deny that. She laughs and sits in the wicker armchair at right rear of table. He comes around in back of her and selects a cigar from a box on the table and cuts off the end with a little clipper. From the dining room, Jamie's and Edmund's voices are heard. Mary turns her head that way. Why did the boy stay in the dining room, I wonder? Kathleen must be waiting to clear the table. So, it's a secret confab they don't want me to hear, I suppose. I'll bet they're cooking up some new scheme to touch the old man. She is silent on this, keeping her head turned towards their voices. Her hands appear on the tabletop, moving restlessly. He lights his cigar and sits down in the rocker at right of table, which is his chair, and puffs contentedly. There's nothing like the first after breakfast cigar. Uh, if it's a good one, and this new lot have the right mellow flavor. They're a great bargain, too. I got them dead cheap. It was Maguire put me onto them. I hope he didn't put you onto any new piece of property at the same time. His real estate bargains don't work out so well. Well, I wouldn't say that, Mary. After all, he was the one who advised me to buy that place on Chestnut Street, and I made a quick turnover on it for a fine profit. Oh, I know. The famous one stroke of good luck. I'm sure Maguire never dreamed. Never mind, James. I know it's a waste of breath trying to convince you you're not, you're not a cunning real estate speculator. No, I've no such idea. But land is land, and it's safer than the stocks and bonds of Wall Street swindlers. 
But let's not argue about business this early in the morning. The boy's voices are again heard, and one of them has a fit of coughing. (coughs) Mary listens worriedly. Her fingers play nervously on the tabletop. James, it's Edmund you should be scolding for not eating enough. He hardly touched anything except coffee. He needs to eat to keep up his strength. I keep telling him, but he says he simply has no appetite. Of course, there's nothing takes away your appetite like a bad summer cold. Yes, it's only natural, so don't let yourself get worried. Oh, I'm not. I know he'll be all right in a few days if he takes care of himself. But it does seem a shame he should have to be sick right now. Yes, it is bad luck. But you mustn't let it upset you, Mary. Remember, you've got to take care of yourself, too. I'm not upset. There's nothing to be upset about. What makes you think I'm upset? Why, nothing, except you've seemed a bit high-strung the past few days. I have? Oh, nonsense, dear. It's your imagination. You really must not watch me all the time, James. I mean, it makes me self-conscious. Now, now, Mary, that's your imagination. If I've watched you, it was to admire how fat and beautiful you looked. I can't tell you the deep happiness it gives me, darling, to see you as you've been since you came back to us, your dear old self again. So keep up the good work, Mary. I will, dear. Thank heavens the fog is gone. I do feel out of sorts this morning. I wasn't able to get much sleep with that awful foghorn going all night long. Yes, it's like having a sick whale in the backyard. It kept me awake, too. (laughs) Did it? You had a strange way of showing your restlessness. You were snoring so hard I couldn't tell you which was the foghorn. Ten foghorns couldn't disturb you. You haven't a nerve in you. You never had. Nonsense. You always exaggerate about my snoring. I couldn't. If you could only hear yourself once. A burst of laughter comes from the dining room. She turns <laughs> smiling. What's the joke, I wonder? It's on me, I'll bet that much. It's always on the old man. Yes, it's terrible the way we all pick on you, isn't it? You're so abused. <laughs> well, no matter what the joke is about, it's a relief to hear Edmund laugh. He's been so down in the mouth lately. Some joke of Jamie's, I'll wager. He's forever making sneering fun of somebody, that one. Oh, don't start in on poor Jamie, dear. He'll turn out all right in the end. You wait and see. He'd better start soon, then. He's nearly 34. Good heavens, are they going to stay in the dining room all day? Jamie, Edmund, come in the living room and give Kathleen a chance to clear the table. We're coming, Mama. Now you'd find excuses for him no matter what he did. Shh. Their sons, James Jr. and Edmund, enter together from the back parlor. They are both grinning, still chuckling over what had caused their laughter. And as they come forward, they glance at their father and their grin grows broader. Jamie, the elder, is 33. He has his father's broad-shouldered, deep-chested physique, is an inch taller and weighs less, but appears shorter and stouter because he lacks Tyrone's bearing and graceful carriage. He also lacks his father's vitality. The signs of premature disintegration are on him. His face is still good-looking, despite marks of dissipation, but it has never been handsome like Tyrone's, although Jamie resembles him rather than his mother. He has fine brown eyes, their color midway between his father's lighter and his mother's darker ones. His hair is thinning, and already there is indication of a bald spot like Tyrone's. His nose is unlike that of any other member of the family, pronouncedly aquiline. Combined with his habitual expression of cynicism, it gives his countenance a uh, (laughs) Mephistophelian cast. But on the rare occasions when he smiles without sneering, his personality possesses the remnant of a humorous, romantic, irresponsible Irish charm, that of the beguiling 'er ne'er-do-well, with a strain of the uh, sentimentally poetic, attractive to women and popular with men. He is dressed in an old sack suit, not as shabby as Tyrone's, and wears a collar and tie. His fair skin is sunburned, a reddish, freckled tan. Edmund 
is 10 years younger than his brother, a couple of inches taller, thin, and wiry. Where Jamie takes after his father with little resemblance to his mother, Edmund looks like both his parents, but is more like the mother. Her big, dark eyes are the dominant feature in his long, narrow Irish face. His mouth has the same quality of hypersensitiveness hers possesses. His high forehead and hers is hers accentuated with dark brown hair, sun bleached to red at the ends, brushed straight back from it. But his nose is his father's, and his face in profile recalls Tyrone's. Edmund's hands are noticeably like his mother's, with the same exceptionally long fingers. They even have, to a minor degree, the same nervousness. It is in the quality of extreme nervous sensibility that the likeness of Edmund to his mother is most marked. He is plainly in bad health, much thinner than he should be, His eyes appear feverish, and his cheeks are sunken. His skin, in spite of being sunburned a deep brown, has a parched sallowness. He wears a shirt, collar, and tie, no coat, old flannel trousers, brown sneakers. I've been teasing your father about his snoring. I'll leave it to the boy, James. They must have heard you. No, not you, Jamie. I could hear you down the hall almost as bad as your father. You're like him. As soon as your head touches the pillow, you're off and ten fog horns couldn't wake you. Why are you staring, Jamie? Is my hair coming down? It's hard for me to do it up properly now. My eyes are getting so bad and I can never find my glasses. <clears throat> your hair's all right, Mama. I was only thinking how well you look. Just what I've been telling her, Jamie. She's so fat and sassy, there'll soon be no holding her. Yes, you certainly look grand, Mama. And I'll keep help back you up on Papa's snoring. Gosh, what a racket. <laughs> I heard him too. The more I know his trumpet. <laughs> if it takes my snoring to make you remember Shakespeare instead of the dope sheet on the ponies, I hope I'll keep on with it. Oh, now, James, you mustn't be so touchy. Yeah. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, is that me? Uh, yes, for Pete's sake, Papa. For Pete's sake, Papa, the first thing after breakfast, give it a rest, can't you? Your father wasn't finding fault with you. You don't have to always take Jamie's part. You'd think you were the one ten years older. What's all the fuss about? Let's forget it. Yes, forget. Forget everything and face nothing. It's a convenient philosophy if you know ambition in life, except to... James, do be quiet. You must have gotten out, the wrong, out of bed the wrong side this morning. What were you two grinning about like Cheshire cats when you came in? What was the joke? Yes, let us in on it. Don't look at me, it's the kid's story. <laughs> uh, I meant to tell you last night, Papa, and forgot it. Um, yesterday when I went for a walk, I dropped in at the inn. Oh, you shouldn't drink now, Edmund. And and who do you think I met there with a beautiful bun on, but Shaughnessy, the tenant on that farm of yours? A dreadful man. <laughs> but he is funny. Tyrone realized he was muted and started his speech over. I don't know why that ended muting me. Sorry. Uh, He's not so funny when you're his landlord. He's a wily shanty mick, that one. He could hide behind a corkscrew. What's he complaining about now, Edmund? For I'm damn sure he's complaining. I suppose he wants his rent lowered. I let him have the place for almost nothing just to keep someone in it. And he never pays that till I threatened to evict him. No, no, he, he didn't beef about anything. He was so pleased with life, he even bought a drink, and that's practically unheard of. He was delighted because he'd had a fight with your friend Harker, the standard oil millionaire, and won a glorious victory. 
<laughs> oh, Lord, James, you really have to do something. Bad luck to Shaughnessy anyway. Oh, I bet the next time you see Harker at the club and give him the old respectful bow, he won't see you. Yes, Harker will thank you, no gentleman, for harboring a tenant who isn't humbled in the presence of a king of America. Never mind the socialist gabble. I don't care to listen. Go on with your story, Edmund. Well, you remember, Papa, the ice pond on Harker's estate is right next to the farm. And you remember, Shaughnessy keeps pigs. Well, it seems there's a break in the fence, and the pigs have been bathing in the millionaire's ice pond. And Harker's foreman told him he was sure Shaughnessy had broken the fence on purpose to give his pigs a free wallow. Oh, good heavens! <laughs> I'm sure he did, too. A dirty scallywag. It's like him. So, Harker came in person to rebuke Shaughnessy. <laughs> Very bonehead play. If I needed any further proof that our ruling plutocrats, especially the ones who inherited their boodle, are not mental giants, that would clinch it. Yes, he'd be no match for Shaughnessy. Uh, keep your damn anarchist remarks to yourself. I won't have them in my house. What happened? Well, Harker had as much chance as I would with Jack Johnson. Shaughnessy got a few drinks under his belt and was waiting at the gate to welcome him. He told him, uh, he told me he never gave Harker a chance to open his mouth. He began by shouting that he was no slave Standard Oil could trample on. He was a king of Ireland if he had his rights, and scum was scum to him, no matter how much money it had stolen from the poor. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> then he accused Harker of making his foreman break down the fence to entice the pigs into the ice pond in order to destroy them. The poor pigs, Shaughnessy yelled, had caught their death of cold. Many of them were dying of pneumonia, and several others had been taken down with cholera from drinking the poisoned water. He told Harker he was suing, uh, uh, hiring a lawyer to sue him for damages, and he would, and he wound up by saying that he had uh, had to put up with poison ivy, ticks, potato bugs, snakes, and skunks on this farm. But he was an honest man who drew who drew the line somewhere, and he'd be damned if he'd stand for a standard oil thief trespassing. So would Harker kindly remove his dirty feet from the premises before he sick the dogs on him? And Harker did. <laughs> 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 that has. Uh, damned old scoundrel. My God, you can't beat him. <laughs> <laughs> the dirty blagger. He'll get me in serious trouble yet. I hope you told him I'd be mad as hell. Oh, I told him you'd be tickled to death over the great Irish victory, and so you are. Stop faking, Papa. <laughs> no, I'm not tickled to death. Oh, you are too, James. You're simply delighted. No, Mary, a joke is a joke, but... I told Shaughnessy he should have reminded Harker that a standard oil millionaire ought to welcome the flavor of hog in his ice water as an appropriate touch. The devil you did. <laughs> Keep your damn socialist anarchist sentiments out of my affairs. Shaughnessy almost wept because he hadn't thought of that one, but he said he'd include it in a letter he's writing to, to Harker along with a few other insults he'd, you know, <laughs> <laughs> What are you laughing at? <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing funny. Fine son you are to help that blaggard get me into a lawsuit. No, James, don't lose your temper. And you're worse than he is, encouraging him. I suppose you're regretting you weren't there to prompt Shaughnessy with a few nastier insults. You have a fine talent for that, if for nothing else. James, there's no reason to scold Jamie. <sighs> for God's sake, Papa, if you're starting that stuff again, I'll beat it. I left my book upstairs anyway. God, Papa, I should think you'd get sick of hearing yourself. You mustn't mind Edmund, James. Remember, he isn't well. Edmund can be heard coughing as he goes upstairs. <coughs> the cold makes, makes anyone irritable. It's not just a cold he's got. The kid is damn sick. Why do you say that? It is just a cold. Anyone can tell that. You always imagine things. All Jamie meant was Edmund might have a touch of something else, too, which makes his cold worse. Sure, Mama, that, that's all I meant. Dr. Hardy thinks it might be a bit of malarial fever he caught when he was in the tropics. If it is, quinine will sure, soon cure it. Dr. Harding, 
I wouldn't believe a word he said if he swore on a stack of Bibles. I know what doctors are. They're all alike. Anything, they don't care what, to keep you coming to them. What is, what is it? What are you looking at? Is it, is it my hair? There's nothing wrong with your hair. The healthier and fatter you get, the vainer you become. You'll soon spend the half the day primping before the mirror. I really should have new glasses. My eyes are so bad now. You, your eyes are beautiful and well, you know it. He gives her a kiss. You mustn't be so silly, James. Right in front of Jamie. Oh, he's on to you too. He knows this fuss about eyes and hair is only fishing for compliments. Hey, Jamie? Yes, you can't kid us, Mama. No, oh, go along with both of you. But I did truly have beautiful hair once, didn't I, James? The most beautiful in the world. It was a rare shade of reddish brown and so long it came down below my knees. You want to remember that too, Jamie. It, was, it wasn't until after Edmund was born that I had a single gray hair. Then it began to turn white. And that made it prettier than ever. Will you listen to your father, Jamie? After 35 years of marriage, he's still a great actor for nothing, is he? What's come over you, James? Are you pouring coals of fire on my head for teasing you about snoring? Well, then I take it all back. It must have been only the foghorn I heard. But I can't stay with you any longer, even to hear compliments. I must go see the cook about dinner and the day's marketing. Bridget is so lazy and so sly. She begins telling me about her relatives, so I can't get a word in Edways to scold her. Well, I might as well get it over with. You mustn't make Edmund work out on the grounds with you, James, remember? Not that he isn't strong enough, but he'll perspire and he might catch more cold. She disappears through the back parlor. You're a fine lunkhead. Haven't you any sense? The one thing to avoid is saying anything that would get her more upset over Edmund. All right. Have it your way. I think it's the wrong idea to let Mama go on kidding herself. That'll only make the shock worse when she has to face it. Anyway, you can see she's deliberately fooling herself with that summer cold talk. She knows better. Knows? Nobody knows yet. Well, I do. I was with Edmund when he went to Doc Hardy on Monday. I heard him pull that touch of malaria stuff. He was stalling. That isn't what he thinks anymore. You know it as well as I do. You talked to him when you went to Uptown yesterday, didn't you? He couldn't say anything for sure yet. He's to phone me today before Edmund goes to him. So he thinks it's consumption, doesn't he, Papa? He said it might be. Poor kid. Damn it! It might never have happened if you'd sent him to a real doctor when he first got sick. What's the matter with Hardy? He's always been our doctor up here. To everything's the matter with him. Even in this Hickburg, he's third class. He's a cheap old quack. That's right. Run him down. Run down everybody. Everyone is fake to you. The Hardy only charges a dollar. That's what makes you think he's a fine doctor. That's enough. You're not drunk now. There's no excuse. If you mean I can't afford one of the fine society doctors who prey on the rich summer people. You can't afford? <laughs> You're one of the biggest property owners around here. That doesn't mean I'm rich. It's all mortgage. Uh, because you always buy more instead of paying off mortgages. If Edmund was a lousy acre of land you wanted, the sky would be the limit. That's a lie. And your sneers against Dr. Hardy are lies. He doesn't put on frills or have an office in a fashionable location or drive around an expensive automobile. That's what you pay for with those other five dollars to look at your tongue, fellows. Not their skill. Oh, all right. I'm a fool to argue. You can't change the leopard's spots. No, you can't. You've taught me that lesson only too well. I've lost all hope you will ever change yours. You dare tell me what I can afford. You've never known the value of a dollar and never will. You've never saved a dollar in your life. At the end of each season, you're penniless. You've thrown your salary away every week on whores and whiskey. My salary? Christ! That's more than you're worth. And you couldn't get that if it wasn't for me. If you weren't my son, there isn't a manager in the business who would give you a part. Your reputation stinks so. As it is, I have to humble my pride and beg for you, saying you've turned over a new leaf, although I know it's a lie. I never wanted to be an actor. You forced me on the stage. 
That's a lie. You made no efforts to find anything else to do. You left it to me to get you a job and I have no influence except in the theater. Forced you. You never wanted to do anything except loaf in bar rooms. You'd have been content to sit back like a lazy lunk and sponge on me for the rest of your life. After all the money I'd wasted on your education, and all you did was get fired in disgrace from every college you went to. Oh, for God's sake, don't you drag up that ancient history. It's not ancient history that you have to come home every summer to live on me. I earn my board and lodging working on the grounds. It saves you hiring a man. <laughs> you have to be driven to do even that much. I wouldn't give a damn if you ever displayed the slightest sign of gratitude. The only thanks is to have you sneer at me for a dirty miser. Sneer at my profession. Sneer at every damn thing in the world, except yourself. That's not true, Papa. You can't hear me talking to myself. That's all. In gratitude, the vilest weed that grows. Oh, I could see that line coming. God, how many thousand times? All right, Papa, I'm a bum. Anything you like, so long as it stops the argument. If you'd get ambition in your head instead of folly, you're young yet, you could still make your mark. You had the talent to become a fine actor. You, st you have it still. Let's you're forget my son. me. I'm not interested in the subject, neither are you. What started us on this? Oh, Doc Hardy. When's he gonna call you up about Edmund? Around lunchtime. I couldn't have sent Edmund to a better doctor. Hardy's treated him ev whenever he was sick up here, since he was knee high. He knows his constitution as no other doctor could. It's not a question of my being miserly and you'd, as you'd like to make out. And what could the finest specialist in America do for Edmund after he's deliberately ruined his health by the mad life he's led ever since he was fired from college? Even before that, when he was in prep school, he began dissipating and playing the Broadway sport to imitate you. But when he's never had your constitution to stand it, you're a healthy hulk like me. Or you were at his age, but he's always been a bundle of nerves like his mother. I've warned him for years his body couldn't stand it, but he wouldn't heed me, and now it's too late. What do you mean, too late? You talk as if you thought... Don't be a damned fool. I meant nothing but what's plain to anyone. His health has broken down, and he may be an invalid for a long time. I know it's an Irish peasant idea, consumption is fatal. It probably is when you live in a hovel or a bog, but over here with modern treatment. Don't I know that? What are you gabbling about anyway? And keep your dirty tongue off Ireland with your sneers about peasants and bogs and hovels. The less you say about Edmund's sickness, the better for your conscience. You're not, you're more responsible than anyone. That's a lie. I won't stand for that, Papa. It's the truth. You've been the worst influence for him. He grew up admiring you as a hero, a fine example you set him. If you ever gave him advice except in the ways of rottenness, I've never heard of it. You made him old before his time, pumping him full of what you consider worldly wisdom. When he was too young to see that your mind was so poisoned by your own failure in life, you wanted to believe every man was a knave with his soul for sale and every woman who wasn't a whore was a fool. All right. I did put Edmund wise to things, but not until I saw he'd started to raise hell and knew he'd laugh at me if I tried the good advice, older brother stuff. All I did was make a pal of him, and to be absolutely frank, so he'd learn from my mistakes that, well, that if you can't be good, you can at least be careful. <laughs> That's a rotten accusation, Papa. You know how much the kid means to me and how close we've always been, not like the usual brothers. I'd do anything for him. I know you may have thought it was for the best, Jamie. I didn't say you did it deliberately to harm him. Besides, it's a damned rot. <laughs> I'd like to see anyone influence Edmund more than he wants to be. His quietness fools people into thinking that they can do what they like with him, but he's stubborn as hell inside. And what he does is what he wants to do and to hell with anyone else. What did I do with all the crazy stunts he's pulled in the last few years, working his way all over the map as a sailor and all that stuff? I thought that was a damn fool idea and I told him so. 
You can't imagine me getting fun out of being on the beach in South America or living in filthy dives, drinking rot gut, can you? No thanks. I'll stick to Broadway and a room with a bath and the bars that serve bonded bourbon. You who in Broadway, it made you what you are. Whatever Edmund's done, he's had the guts to go off on his own, where he couldn't come whining to me the minute he was broke. He's always come home broke finally, hasn't he? And what did his going away get him? Look at him now. Christ. That's a lousy thing to say. I don't, I don't mean that. He's been doing well on the paper. I was hoping he'd found the work he wants to do at last. A hick town rag? <laughs> Whatever bull they hand you, they tell me he's a pretty bum reporter. And if he weren't your son, oh no, that's not true. They're glad to have him, but it's the special stuff that gets him by. Some of the poems and parodies he's written are damn good. Not that they'd ever get him anywhere in the big time, but he certainly made a damn good start. Yes, he's made a start. You used to talk about wanting to become a newspaper man, but you were never willing to start at the bottom. You expected- Oh, for Christ's sake, Papa, can you lay off me? <sighs> it's damnable luck. Edmund should be sick right now. It couldn't have come at a worse time for him. Or for your mother. It's damnable she should have this to upset her just when she needs peace and freedom from worry. She's been so well in the last in the two months since she came home. It's been heaven to me. This home has been a home again, but I needn't tell you, Jamie. I felt the same way, Papa. Yes, this time you can see how strong and sure of herself she is. She's a different woman entirely from the other times. She has control of her nerves, or she had until Edmund got sick. Now you can feel her growing tense and frightened underneath. I wish to God we could keep the truth from her, but we can't if he has to be sent to a sanatorium. What makes it worse is her father died of consumption. She worshiped him and she's never forgotten. Yes, it will be hard for her, but she can do it. She has the willpower now. We must help her, Jamie, in every way we can. Of course, Papa. Outside of nerves, she seems perfectly all right this morning. Never better, she's full of fun and mischief. Why do you say seems? Why shouldn't she be all right? What the hell do you mean? Don't start jumping down my throat. God, Papa, this ought to be the one thing we can talk over frankly without a battle. I'm sorry, Jamie, but go on and tell me. That there's nothing to tell. I was all wrong. It's just that last night. Well, you know how it is. I can't forget the past. I can't help being suspicious any more than you can. And that's the hell of it. And it makes it hell for Mama. She watches us watching her. I know. Well, what was it? Can't you speak out? Nothing, I tell you. It's just my damn foolishness. Around three o'clock in the morning, I woke up and heard her moving around in the spare room. Then she went to the bathroom. I pretended to be asleep. She stopped in the hall to listen as if she wanted to make sure I was. For God's sake, is that all? She told me herself the foghorn kept her awake all night, and every night since Edmund's been sick, she's been up and down, going to his room to see how he was. Yes, that's right. She did stop to listen outside his room. It, it was her being in the spare room that scared me. I couldn't help remembering that when she starts sleeping alone in there, it has always been a sign. It isn't this time. It's easily explained. Where else could she go last night to get away from my snoring? By God, how can you live with a mind that sees nothing but the worst motives behind everything is beyond me? Don't pull that. I've just said I was wrong. Don't you suppose I'm as glad of that as you are? I'm sure you are, Jamie. It would be like a curse she can't escape if worry over Edmund. It was in her long sickness after bringing him into the world that she... First... She didn't have anything to do with it. I'm not blaming her. Then who are you blaming? Edmund? For being born? You damned fool. No one was to blame. The bastard of a doctor was. 
from what Mama said, he was an, another cheap quack like Hardy, and you wouldn't pay for a first-rate... That's a lie. So I'm to blame. That's what you're driving at, is it? You <laughs> minded loafer. Well, if we're going to cut the front hedge today, we better get to work. Yes, it's too fine a morning to waste indoors arguing. Take a look out the window, Mary. There's no fog in the harbor. I'm sure the spell of it we've had is over now. I hope so, dear. Did I actually hear you suggesting work on the front hedge, Jamie? Wonders will never cease. You must want pocket money badly. When don't I? I expect a salary of at least one large iron man at the end of the week to carouse on. What were you two arguing about? Mm, same old stuff. I heard you say something about a doctor and your father accusing you of being evil-minded. Oh, that. No, I was just saying again, Doc Cardi isn't my idea of the world's greatest physician. Oh, no, I wouldn't say he was either. Oh, that Bridget. I thought I'd never get away. She told me all about her second cousin on the police force in St. Louis. Well, if you're going to work on the hedge, why don't you go? I mean, take advantage of the sunshine before the fog comes back. Because I know it will. Oh, I should say the rheumatism in my hand knows. It's a better weather prophet than you are, James. Ugh, how ugly they are. Who'd ever have believed they were once beautiful? Now, now, Mary, none of that foolishness. They're the sweetest hands in the world. Come on, Jamie, your mother's right to scold us. The way to start work is to start work. The hot sun will sweat some of that booze fat off your middle. He opens the screen door and goes out on the porch and disappears down a flight of steps leading to the ground. We're all so proud of you, Mama. So darn happy. you still got to be careful. You mustn't worry so much about Edmund. He'll be all right. Of course he'll be all right. But I, I don't know what you mean, warning me to be careful. All right, Mama. I'm sorry I spoke. He goes out on the porch. She waits rigidly until he disappears down the steps. Then she sinks down in the chair he had occupied her face betraying a frightened, furtive desperation, her hands roving over the tabletop, aimlessly moving objects around. She hears Edmund descending the stairs in the front hall. As he nears the bottom, he has a fit of coughing. <coughs> she springs to her feet as if she wanted to run away from the sound and goes quickly to the windows at right. She is looking out, apparently calm, as he enters from the front parlor, a book in one hand, she turns to him, her lips set in a welcoming, motherly smile. Here you are. I was just going upstairs to look for you. Uh, I waited until they went out. I don't want to get mixed up in any arguments. I feel too rotten. Oh, I'm sure you don't feel half as badly as you make out. You're such a baby. You like to get us worried so we'll all fuss over you. I'm only teasing, dear. I know how miserably uncomfortable you must be. But... You feel better today, don't you? All the same, you've grown much too thin. You need to rest all you can. Sit down and I'll make you comfortable. There. How's that? Grand. Thanks, Mama. All you need is your mother to nurse you. Big as you are, you're still the baby of the family to me, you know. <laughs> Never mind me. You take care of yourself. That's all that counts. But I, I am, dear. Oh, heavens, you see how fat I've grown? I'll have to have all my dresses let out. <laughs> they started clipping the hedge. Poor Jeannie, how he hates working in front of everybody passing can see him. They got the Chatfields in their new Mercedes. It's a beautiful car, isn't it? Not like our secondhand Packard. Poor Jamie, he bent down under the hedge so they wouldn't notice him. They bowed to your father and he bowed back as if he were taking a curtain call. 
in that filthy old suit I've tried to make him throw away. Really, he ought to have more pride than to make such a show of himself. He's right not to give a damn what anyone thinks. Jamie's a fool to care about the Chatfields. For Pete's sake, whoever heard of them outside of this Hickberg? No one. You're quite right, Edmund. Big frogs, small puddle. It is stupid of Jamie. Still, the Chatfields and people like them stand for something. I mean, they have decent, presentable homes they don't have to be ashamed of. They have friends who entertain them and whom they entertain. They're not cut off from everyone. Not that I want anything to do with them. I've always hated this town and everyone in it. You know that. I never wanted to live here in the first place, but your father liked it and insisted on building this house, and I've had to come here every summer. Well, it, it's better than spending the summer in a New York hotel, isn't it? And this town's not so bad. I like it well enough. I suppose because it's the only home we've had. I've never felt it was my home. It was wrong from the start. Everything was done in the cheapest way. Your father would never spend money to make it right. It's just as well we haven't any friends here. I'd be ashamed to have them step in the door. But he never wanted family friends. He hates calling on people or receiving them. All he likes is to hobnob with men in the club or in the bar room. Jamie and you are the same way, but you're not to blame. You've never had a chance to meet decent people here. I know you both would have been so different if you'd just been able to associate with nice girls instead of... You'd never have disgraced yourself if you had, or, you'd, or, or now no respectable parents will let their daughters be seen with you. I don't know, forget it. Who cares? Jamie and I would be bored stiff. And about the old man, what's the use of talking? You can't change him. Don't call your father an old man. You should have more respect. I know it's useless to talk, but sometimes I just feel so lonely. Anyway, I've got to be fair, Mama. It may have been all his fault in the beginning, but you know that later on, even if he'd wanted to, we couldn't have had people here. I mean, you wouldn't have wanted them. Don't. I can't bear having you remind me. No, don't don't take it that way, please, Mama. I'm trying to help. Because it's bad for you to forget. The right way is to remember, so you'll always be on your guard. You, you know what's happened before. God, Mama, you know, I hate to remind you. I'm doing it because it's been so wonderful having you home the way you've been, and, and it would be terrible if... Please, dear. I know you mean it for the best, but... I, I don't understand why you should suddenly say such things. What, what put this in your mind this morning? Nothing. I, just because I feel rotten and blue, I suppose. Tell me the truth. Why are you so suspicious all of a sudden? Not. Oh, yes, you are. I can feel it. Your father and Jamie, too. Particularly Jamie. Don't, don't start imagining things, Mama. It makes it so much harder living in this atmosphere of constant suspicion. Knowing everyone is spying on me. And none of you believe me or trust me. No, that's crazy. Mama, we do trust you. If there was only some place I could go to get away for a day or even for an afternoon, some woman friend I could talk to, not about anything serious, simply laugh and gossip and forget for a while. Someone beside the servants, that stupid Kathleen. Stop it, Mama. You're getting yourself worked up over nothing. Your father goes out. He meets his friend in barrooms or at the club. You and Jamie have the boys you know. You go out. But I'm alone. I've always been alone. Come come now. You you know that's a fib. One of us always stays around to keep you company or, or goes with you in the automobile when you take a drive. Because you're afraid to trust me alone. I insist you tell me why you act so differently this morning. Why you felt you had to remind me that... It's stupid. It's just that I wasn't asleep when you came in my room last night. You didn't go back to your and Papa's room. You went in the spare room for the rest of the night. Because your father's snoring was driving me crazy. For heaven's sake, haven't I often used the spare room as my bedroom? <sighs> but I see what you thought. That was when... But I didn't think anything. 
So you pretended to be asleep in order to spy on me? No, 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 no. I did it because I knew if you found out I was feverish and couldn't sleep, it would upset you. Jamie was pretending to be asleep too. I'm sure, and I suppose your father. Stop it, stop it, Mama. Oh, I can't bear it, Edmund, when even you. It would serve you all right if it were true. M Mama, don't say that. That's the way you talk when, when you've... Stop suspecting me. Please, dear. You, you hurt me. I couldn't sleep because I was thinking about you. That's the real reason. I've been worried about you ever since you've been sick. That, that's foolishness. You, you know it's only a bad cold. Yes, of course, I know that. But listen, Mama, I want you to promise me that even if it should turn out to be something worse, you'll, uh, you, you'll know I'll be all right soon again anyway, and, and you won't worry yourself sick, and you'll, you'll keep on taking care of yourself. I won't listen when you're so silly. <laughs> There's absolutely no reason to talk as if you expected something dreadful. Of course, I promise you, I give you my sacred word of honor. But I suppose you're remembering I've promised before on my word of honor. No. I'm not blaming you, dear. How can you help it? How can, how can any one of us forget? That's what makes it so hard for all of us. We can't forget. Mama, stop it. All right, dear. I didn't mean to be so gloomy. Don't mind me. Here, let me feel your head. Why? It's nice and cool. You certainly haven't any fever now. Get me. It's you, Mom. But I'm quite all right, dear. Except I naturally feel tired and nervous this morning after such a bad night. I really ought to go upstairs and lie down until lunchtime and take a nap. What are you going to do? Read here? It would be so much better for you to go out in the fresh air and sunshine. But don't get overheated, remember? Be sure to wear a hat. Or are you afraid to trust me alone? No, can't you stop talking like that? I, no, I think you ought to take a nap. I'll go down and uh, help Jamie bear up. <laughs> I love to sit in the shade and watch him work. <laughs> he forces a laugh in which she makes herself join. Then he goes out on the porch and disappears down the steps. Her first reaction is one of relief. She appears to relax. She sinks down in one of the wicker armchairs at rear of table and leans her head back, closing her eyes. But suddenly, she grows terribly tense again. Her eyes open and she strains forward, seized by a fit of nervous panic. She begins a desperate battle with herself. Her long fingers, warped and knotted by rheumatism, drum on the arms of the chair, driven by an insistent life of their own, without her consent. Curtain. Act two, scene one. Scene the same. It is around quarter to one. No sunlight comes into the room now through the windows at right. Outside, the day is still fine, but increasingly sultry, with a faint haziness in the air which softens the glare of the sun. Edmund sits in the armchair at left of table, reading a book. Or rather, he is trying to concentrate on it, but cannot. He seems to be listening for some sound from upstairs. His manner is nervously apprehensive, and he looks more sickly than in the previous act. The second girl, Kathleen, enters from the back parlor. She carries a tray on which is a bottle of bonded bourbon, several whiskey glasses, and a pitcher of ice water. She is a buxom Irish peasant in her early 20s with a red-cheeked, comely face, black hair, and blue eyes. Amiable, ignorant, clumsy, and possessed by a dense, well-meaning stupidity. She puts the tray on the table. Edmund pretends to be so absorbed in his book he does not notice her, but she ignores this. Here's the whiskey. It'll be lunchtime soon. Will I call your father and Mr. Jamie, or will you? I 
can't hear you. Kathleen, you do it. It's a wonder your father wouldn't look at his watch once in a while. He's a devil for making meals late. And then Bridget curses me as if I were to blame. But he's a grand, handsome man, as he is old. You'll never see the day you're as good looking as him, nor Mr. Jamie neither. <laughs> I'll wager Mr. Jamie wouldn't miss the time to stop work and have a drop of whiskey if he had a watch to his name. You win that one. And here's another I'd win. That you're making me call them so that you can drink, sneak a drink before they come. Well, I hadn't thought of that. Oh, no, not you. Butter wouldn't melt in your mouth, I suppose. But now you suggest it. Oh, I'd never suggest a man or woman touch drink, Mr. Edmund. Sure, didn't it kill an uncle of mine back in the old country? Still, a drop now and then is no harm when you're in low spirits or have a bad cold. Thanks for handing me a good excuse. You'd better call my mother, too. What for? She's always on time without me calling. God bless her. She has some consideration for the help. But she's been taking a nap. She wasn't asleep when I finished my work upstairs a while back. She was lying down in the spare room with her eyes wide open. She had a terrible headache, she said. Oh, uh, well, then just call my father. No wonder my feet kill me each night. I won't walk out in this heat and get sunstroke. I'll call from the porch. She goes out. She goes out on the side porch, letting the screen door slam behind her and disappears on her way to the front porch. A moment later, she is heard shouting. Mr. Tyrone, Mr. Jamie, it's time. God, what a winch. He grabs a bottle and pours a drink, adds ice water and drinks. As he does so, he hears someone coming in the front door. He puts the glass hastily on the tray and sits down again, opening his book. Jamie comes in from the front parlor his coat over his arm. He has taken off collar and tie and carries them in his hand. He is wiping sweat from his forehead with a handkerchief. Edmund looks up as if his reading was interrupted. Jamie takes one look at the bottle and glasses and smiles cynically. Sneak in one, eh? Cut out the bluff, kid. You're rottener actor than I am. Yes, I grabbed one while the glory was good. That's better. Why kid me? We're pals, aren't we? I wasn't sure it was you coming. I made the old man look at his watch. I was halfway up the walk when Kathleen burst into song. <laughs> Our wild Irish lark. She ought to be a train announcer. <laughs> That's what drove me to drink. Hey, why don't you sneak one while you've got a chance? I was thinking of that little thing. The old man was talking to old Captain Turner. Mm. Yep, he's still at it. Now. To cover up from his eagle eye, he memorizes the level in the bottle after every drink. He measures two drinks of water and pours them in the whiskey bottle and shakes it up. There. That fixes it. He pours water in the glass and sets it on the table by Edmund. And here's the water you've been drinking. Fine. You don't think that's going to fool him, do you? Maybe not, but I can't prove it. I hope he doesn't forget lunch. Listening to himself talk. I'm hungry. That's what I hate about working down in front. He puts on an act for every damn fool that comes along. <coughs> You're lucky to be hungry. The way I feel, I don't care if I ever eat again. Listen, kid. You know me. I've never lectured you. But Dr. Hardy was right when he told you to cut out the red eye. Oh, I'm going to. After he hands me the bad news this afternoon. A few before then won't make any difference. I'm glad you've got your mind prepared for bad news. Won't be such a jolt. I mean, it's a sense you're really sick. It would be wrong dope to kid yourself. Well, I'm not. I know how rotten I feel. And the fever and chills I get at night are no joke. I think Dr. Hardy, I think Dr. Hardy's last guess was right. It must be a damned malaria come back on me. Maybe. But don't be too sure. Why? What do you think it is? How, how would I know? I'm not Doc. Where's Mama? Upstairs. When did she go up? Oh, about the time I came down to the hedge, I guess. Uh, she said she was going to take a nap. 
You didn't tell me. Why should I? F what about it? She was tired out. She didn't get much sleep last night. I know she didn't. The damned fog one kept me awake, too. She's been upstairs all morning alone? You haven't seen her? No, I've been reading here. I wanted to give her a chance to sleep. Will she be coming down to lunch? Of course. No. No, of course about it. She might not want any lunch. Or she might start having more of her meals alone upstairs. That's happened, hasn't it? Cut it out, Jamie. Can't you think of anything but... You're all wrong to suspect anything. Kathleen saw her not long ago. Mama didn't tell her she wouldn't come down to lunch. And she wasn't taking a nap. Not, not right then, but she was lying down, Kathleen said. In the spare room? Yes, for Pete's sake, what of it? You damn fool! Why did you let her leave her alone so long? Why didn't you stick around? She accused me and you and Papa of spying on her all the time and not trusting her. She made me feel ashamed. I know how rotten it must be for her, and she promised on her sacred word of honor. You ought to know that doesn't mean anything. It does this time. That's what we thought the other times. <sighs> Listen, kid. I know you think I'm a cynical bastard, but remember, I've seen a lot more of this game than you have. You never knew what was really wrong until you were in prep school. Papa and I kept it from you. But I was wise 10 years or more before we had to tell you. I know the game backwards, and I've been thinking all morning of the way she acted last night when she thought we were asleep. I haven't been able to think of anything else. And now you tell me that she got you to leave her alone upstairs all morning? She did it. You're crazy. All right, kid. Don't start a battle with me. I hope as much as you do, I'm crazy. I've been as happy, and ha as happy as hell because I'd really begun to believe that this time... She's coming downstairs. You win on that. I guess I'm a damn suspicious louse. Damn. I wish I'd grabbed another drink. Yeah, me too. He coughs nervously, and this brings on a real fit of coughing. <coughs> Jamie glances at him with worried pity. Mary enters from the front parlor. At first, one notices no change, except that she appears to be less nervous, to be more as she was when we first saw her after breakfast. But then one becomes aware that her eyes are brighter, and there is a peculiar detachment in her voice and manner, as if she was a little withdrawn from her words and actions. You mustn't cough like that. It's bad for your throat. You don't want to get a sore throat on top of your cold. She kisses him. He stops coughing and gives her a quick, apprehensive glance. But if his suspicions are aroused, her tenderness makes him renounce them, and he believes what he wants to believe for the moment. On the other hand... Jamie knows after one probing look at her that his suspicions are justified. His eyes fall to stare at the floor. His face sets in an expression of an embittered, defensive cynicism. Mary goes on, half sitting on the arm of Edmund's chair, her arm around him, so her face is above and behind his, and he cannot look into her eyes. But I seem to be always picking on you, telling you, don't do this, don't do that. Forgive me, dear. I just didn't want to take care of you. I know, Mama. How about you? <laughs> you feel rested? Oh, yes. Ever so much better. I've been lying down ever since you went out. It's what I needed just after such a restless night. I don't feel nervous now. That's fine. Good heavens. How down in the mouth you look, Jamie. What's the matter now? Nothing. Oh, I'd forgotten you've been working on the front edge. That accounts for your sinking into the dumps, doesn't it? If you want to think so, Mama. Well, that's the effect it always has, isn't it? What a big baby you are. Isn't he, Edmund? <laughs> yeah, he's certainly a fool to care what anyone thinks. Yes. The only way is to make yourself not care. Where's your father? I heard Kathleen call him. Uh, gabbing with old Captain Turner, Jamie says. I've told Kathleen time and time again she must go wherever he is and tell him. The idea of screaming as if it were a cheap boarding house. She's down there now, interrupting the famous beautiful voice. She should have more respect. 
It's you that should have more respect. Stop sneering at your father. I won't have it. You ought to be proud you're his son. He may have his faults. Who hasn't? But he's worked hard all his life. He made his way up from ignorance and poverty to the top of his profession. Everyone else admires him and you should be the last one to sneer. You who, thanks to him, has never worked hard, hard, worked hard in your life. Remember, your father is getting old, Jamie. You really ought to show more consideration. I ought to? Hi up, Jamie. For Pete's sake, Mama, why jump on Jamie all of a sudden? Because he's always sneering at someone else, always looking for the worst weakness in everyone. But I suppose life has made him like that and he can't help it. None of us can help the things that life has made us do. They're done before you realize it. And once they're done, they make you do other things until at last everything comes between you and what you'd like to be. And you've lost your true self forever. I'm hungry. I wish the old man would get a move on. It's rotten trick the way he keeps the meals waiting and then beefs because they're spoiled. Yes, it's very trying, Jamie. You don't know how trying. You don't have to keep house with summer servants who don't, know, don't care because they know it isn't a permanent position. The really good servants are all with people who have homes and not merely summer places. And your father won't even pay the wages the best summer help asks. So every year I have stupid, lazy greenhorns to deal with. But you've heard me say this a thousand times and so has he. But he does, it goes in one ear and out the other. He thinks money spent on a home is money wasted. He's lived too much in hotels. Never the best hotels, of course, second rate hotels. He doesn't understand a home. He doesn't feel at home in it. And yet he wants a home. He's even proud of having this shabby place. He loves it here. <laughs> it's really funny when you think of it. He's a peculiar man. What makes you ramble on like that, Mama? Oh, why, nothing in particular. It, it is foolish. Kathleen enters from the back parlor. Sorry, uh, lunch is ready, ma'am. I went down to Mr. Tyrone like you ordered and he said he'd come right away, but he kept on talking to that man, telling him of the time when, you know. All right, Kathleen. Kel Bridget, I'm sorry, but you'll have to wait a few minutes until Mr. Tyrone is here. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Kathleen goes off through the back parlor, grumbling to herself. Damn it. Why don't you go ahead without him? He told us to. He doesn't mean it. Don't you know your father yet? He'd be terribly hurt. I'll make him get a move on. Uh, <clears throat> hey. Hey, Papa. Come on. We can't wait all day. Why do you stare like that? You know. I don't know. Oh, for God's sake. Do you think you can fool me, Mama? I'm not blind. I don't know what you're talking about. No. Take a look at your eyes in the mirror. <coughs> I got Papa moving. He'll be here in a minute. What's happened? What's the matter, Mama? Your brother ought to be ashamed of himself. He's been insinuating I don't know what. God damn you. Stop this at once. Do you hear me? How dare you use such language before me? It's wrong to blame your brother. He can't help being what the past has made him any more than your father can. Or you. Or I. But he's a liar. It's a lie, isn't it, Mama? What is a lie? What do you... Now you're talking in riddles, Jamie. Edmund, don't. Oh, there's your father coming up the steps now. I must tell Bridget. Well? Well what? You're a liar. The screen door on the front porch is heard closing. So, uh, so, uh, 
Is that me? I'm, I I feel like I'm. Uh, this this has a gap in it too. Sorry. Uh, whose line is it? Yours. Here's, here's Papa. I hope he loosens up with that old bottle. Tyrone comes in through the front parlor. He's putting on his coat. Sorry, I'm late. Captain Turner stopped to talk, and once he starts gabbing, you can't get away from him. Hmm. You mean once he starts listening? Uh, it's all right. The level in the bottle hasn't changed. I wasn't noticing that. As if it proved anything with you around. I'm on to your tricks. Did I hear you say let's all have a drink? Jamie is welcome after his hard morning's work, but I won't invite you. Dr. Hardy... Uh, to hell with Dr. Hardy. I feel... All in, Papa. Come along, then. It's before a meal, and I've always found that good whiskey, taken in moderation as an appetizer, is the best of tonics. Edmund gets up as his father passes the bottle to him. He pours a big drink. I said in moderation. He pours his own drink and passes the bottle to Jamie, grumbling. It'd be a waste of breath mentioning moderation to you. Ignoring the hint, Jamie pours a big drink. His father scowls, then, giving it up, resumes his hearty air, raising his glass. Ah, well, here's health and happiness. That's a joke. What is? Nothing. Here's how. What's the matter here? There's gloom in the air you could cut with a knife. You got the drink you were after, didn't you? Why are you wearing that gloomy look on your mug? You won't be singing a song yourself soon. Shut up, Jamie. I thought lunch was ready. I'm hungry as a hunter. Where is your mother? Here I am. I had to calm down, Bridget. She's in a tantrum over you being late again, and I don't blame her. If your lunch is dried up from waiting in the oven, she said, it served you right. You could like it or leave it, as far as she's concerned. Oh, I'm so sick and tired of pretending this is a home. You won't help me. You won't put yourself out in the least bit. You don't know how to act in a home. You don't really want one. You never have wanted one, never since the day we were married. You should have remained a bachelor and lived in second-rate hotels and entertained your friends in bar rooms. Then not, nothing would ever have happened. Mama? Stop talking. Well, why don't we go into lunch? Yes. It is considerate of me to big up the past. When I know your father and Jamie must be hungry. I do hope you have an appetite, dear. You really must eat more. Why is this glass here? Did you, did you take a drink? How can you be such a fool? Don't you know it's the worst thing? You're to blame, James. How could you let him? Do you want to kill him? Do you remember my father who wouldn't stop after he was stricken? He said doctors were fools. He thought, like you, that whiskey is a good tonic. But of course, there's no comparison at all. I don't, I don't know why I, I... Forgive me for scolding you, James. One small drink won't hurt Edmund. It, it might be good for him. It, it may give him an appetite. For God's sake, let's eat. I've been working in the damn dirt under the hedge all morning. I've earned my grub. Come on, kid. Let's put on the feed bag. Yes, you go in with your mother, lads. So I'll join you in a second. Why do you look at me like that? Is, is my hair coming down? I was so worn out from last night. I thought I'd better lie down this morning. I drowsed off and had a nice refreshing nap. And I'm sure I fixed my hair again when I woke up. <laughs> Although, as usual, I couldn't find my glasses. Please stop staring. One would think that you were accusing me. Oh, James, you don't understand. I understand that I've been a goddamned fool to believe in you. I don't know what you mean by believing in me. All I felt was distrust and spying and suspicion. Why are you having another drink? You never have more than one before lunch. I know what to expect. You'll be drunk tonight. 
then it won't be the first time, will it? Or the thousandth. Oh, James, please. You don't understand. I'm so worried about Edmund. I'm so afraid he... I don't want to listen to your excuses, Mary. Excuses? You mean... Oh, you can't believe that of me. You mustn't believe that, James. Shall we go into lunch together, dear? I don't want anything, but I know you're hungry. James, I tried so hard. I tried so hard, please believe me. I, I suppose you did, Mary. For the love of God, why couldn't you have the strength to keep on? I don't know what you're talking about. Have the strength to keep on what? Never mind, it's no use now. He moves on and she keeps beside him as they disappear in the back parlor. Curtain. Act two, scene two. Scene, the same, about a half an hour later. The tray with the bottle of whiskey has been removed from the table. The family are returning from lunch as the curtain rises. Mary is the first to enter from the back parlor. Her husband follows. He is not with her as, as he was in the similar entrance after breakfast at the opening of Act One. He avoids touching her or looking at her. There is condemnation in his face, mingled now with the beginning of an old, weary, helpless resignation. Jamie and Edmund follow their father. Jamie's face is hard with defensive cynicism. Edmund tries to copy this defense, but without success. He plainly shows he is heartsick as well as physically ill. Mary is terribly nervous again, as if the strain of sitting through lunch with them had been too much for her. Yet at the same time, in contrast to this, her expression shows more of that strange aloofness which seems to stand apart from her nerves and the anxieties which harry them. She is talking as she enters, a stream of words that issues casually in a routine of family conversation from her mouth. She appears indifferent to the fact that their thoughts are not on what she is saying any more than her own are. As she talks, she comes to the left of the table and stands, facing front, one hand fumbling with the bosom of her dress, the other playing over the tabletop. Tyrone lights a cigar and goes to the screen door, staring out. Jamie fills a pipe from a jar on the top of the bookcase at rear. He lights it as he goes to look out the window at right. Edmund sits in a chair by the table, turned half away from his mother, so he does not have to watch her. I was no use finding, finding fault with Bridget. She doesn't listen. I can't threaten her. She threatened to leave. And she does do her best at times. It's too bad they seem the way they're just, you're sure to be late, James. Well, there's con this consolation. It's difficult to tell from her cooking whether she's doing her best or her worst. <laughs> Never mind. The summer will soon be over, thank goodness. Your season will be open again. We'll go back to second-rate hotels and trains. I hate them too, but at least I don't expect them to be like a home where there's no housekeeping to worry about. It's unreasonable to expect Bridget or Kathleen to act as if this were a home. They know it isn't as well as we know it. I've never been, I've never has been, and never will be. No, it never can be now. But it was once before you. Before I what? No, no, whatever you mean, it isn't true, dear. It was never a home. You've always preferred the club or a bar room. And for me, it's always been as lonely as a dirty room in a one night stand hotel. It's a real home one is never, is one is never lonely. You forget, I know from experience, what a home is like. I gave one up to marry you, my father's home. I'm worried about you, Edmund. You hardly touch a thing at lunch. That's no way to take care of yourself. It's all right for me not to have an appetite. I've been growing too fat, but you must eat. Promise me you will, dear, for my sake. Yes, Mama. That's a good boy. There's another pause of dead silence. Then the telephone in the front hall rings, and all of them stiffen startedly. I'll answer. McGuire said he'd call me. 
Wire. He must have another piece of property on his list that no one else would think of buying except father. Oh, it doesn't matter anymore, but it's always the same to me. Your father could afford to keep on buying property, but never to give me a home. Hello. Oh, how are you, doctor? Ah, uh, I see. Well, you'll explain all about it when you see him this afternoon. Yes, he'll be in without fail, four o'clock. I'll drop in myself and have a talk with you before that. I have to go uptown on business anyway. Uh, goodbye, doctor. Well, that didn't sound like glad tidings. It was Dr. Hardy. He wants you to be sure and see him at four. What do you say? Not that I give a damn now. I wouldn't believe him if he swore in a stack of Bibles. You mustn't pay any attention to a word he says, Edmund. Mary! Oh, we all realize why you like him, James, because he's cheap. Please don't try to tell me. I know all about Dr. Hardy. Heaven knows I ought to have after all these years. He's an ignorant fool. There should be a law to keep men like him from practicing. He hasn't the slightest idea. When you're in agony and half insane, he sits and holds your hand and delivers sermons on willpower. He deliberately humiliates you. He makes you beg and plead. He treats you like a criminal. He understands nothing and yet was exactly the same type of cheap quack you first gave me the medicine and you never knew it until it was too late. I hate doctors. They're, they'll do anything, anything to keep you coming to them. They'll sell their souls. What's worse, they'll sell yours and you never know it until one day you find yourself in hell. Mama! For God's sake, stop talking! Yes, Mary, it's no time. Uh, 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 forgive me, dear. You're right. It's useless to be angry now. I, I'm going upstairs for a moment, if you'll excuse me. I, I have to fix my hair. That's if I can find my glasses. I, I'll be right down. Mary! Yes, dear. What is it? Nothing. You're welcome to come up and watch me if you're so suspicious. As if that could do any good. You'd only postpone it, and I'm not your jailer. This isn't a prison. No. I know you can't help thinking it's a home. I'm sorry, dear. I didn't mean to be bitter. It's not your fault. She turns and disappears through the back parlor. Another shot in the arm. Cut out that kind of talk. Yes, hold your foul tongue and your rotten Broadway loafers lingo. Have you no decent pity or decency? <sighs> you ought to be kicked out in the gutter, but if I did it, you know damned well who'd weep and plead for you and excuse you and complain till I let you come back. Christ, don't I know that? No pity. I have all the pity in the world for her. I understand what a hard game to beat she's up against, which is more than you ever have. My lingo didn't mean I had no feeling. I was merely putting bluntly what we all know and have to live with now, again. The cures are no damn good except for a while. The truth is there is no cure and we've been sapped to hope. They never come back. They never come back. Everything's in the bag. It's all a frame up. We're all fall guys and suckers and we can't beat the game. Christ, if I felt the way you do, I thought you did. Your poetry isn't very cheery, nor the stuff you read and claim you admire, or your pet with the unpronounceable name, for example. Nietzsche. You don't know what you're talking about. You haven't read him. Enough to know it's a lot of bunk. Shut up, both of you. There's little choice between the philosophy you learned from Broadway loafers and the one Edmund got from his books. They're both rotten to the core. You've both flouted the faith you were born and brought up in, the one true faith of the Catholic Church, and your denial brought nothing but self-destruction. That's the bonk, Papa. We don't pretend at any rate. I don't notice you've worn any holes in the knees of your pants going to Mass. It's true I'm a bad Catholic in the observance. God forgive me. But I believe, and you're a liar. I may not go to church, but every night and morning of my life I get on my knees and pray. Did you pray for Mama? I did. 
I've prayed to God these many years for her. Then Nietzsche must be right. God is dead. Of his pity for man hath God died. If your mother had prayed too, she hasn't denied her faith, but she's forgotten it. Until now, there's no strength of the spirit left in her to fight against her curse. But what's the good of talk? We've lived with this before, and now we must again. There's no help for it. Only I wish she hadn't led me to hope this time. But God, I never will again. That's a rotten thing to say, Papa. Well, I'll hope. She's just started. It can't have got a hold on her yet. She can still stop. I'm going to talk to her. You can't talk to her now. She'll listen, but she won't listen. She'll be here, but she won't be here. You know the way she gets. Yes, that's the way the poison acts on her always. Every day from now on, they'll be the same drifting away from us until by the end of each night. But cut it out, Papa! I'm going to get dressed. I'll make so much noise she can't suspect I've come to spy on her. He disappears through the front parlor and can be heard stamping noisily upstairs. What did Doc Hardy say about the kid? It's what you thought. He's got consumption. God damn it. There's no possible doubt, he said. He'll have to go to a sanatorium. Yes, and the sooner the better, Hardy said. For him and everyone around him. He claims that in six months to a year, Edmund will be cured if he obeys orders. Oh, I never thought a child of mine. It doesn't come from my side of the family. There wasn't one of us that didn't have lungs as strong as an ox. Oh, who gives a damn about that part of it? Where does Hardy want to send him? That's what I'm to see him about. Well, for God's sake, pick out a good place and not some cheap dump. I'll send him wherever Hardy thinks best. <laughs> well, don't give Hardy your over the hills to the poorhouse song about taxes and mortgages. I'm no millionaire who can throw money away. I sh why shouldn't I tell Hardy the truth? Because he'll think you'll want him to pick a cheap dump and because he'll know it isn't the truth. Especially if he hears afterwards you've seen McGuire and let that flannel mouth gold brick merton sting you with another piece of bum property. Keep your nose out of my business. This is Edmund's business. What I'm afraid of is, with your Irish bog-trotter idea that consumption is fatal, you'll figure it would be a waste of money to spend it any more than you can help. You liar. All right. Prove I'm a liar. That's what I want. That's why I brought it up. I have every hope Edmund will be cured and keep your dirty tongue off Ireland. You're a fine one to sneer with the map of it on your face. Not after I wash my face. Well, I've said all I have to say. It's up to you. What do you want me to do this afternoon? Now you're going uptown. I've done all I can do on the hedge until you cut more of it, and you don't want me to go ahead with your clipping. I know that. No, you'd get it crooked as you get everything else. Then I'd better go uptown with Edmund. The bad news coming on top of what's happened to Mama may hit him hard. Yes, go with him, Jamie. Keep up his spirits if you can. If you, if you can, without making an excuse to get drunk. What would I use for money? The last I heard, they were still selling booze, not giving it away. I'll get dressed. He stops in the doorway as he sees his mother approaching from the hall and moves aside to let her come in. Her eyes look brighter, and her manner is more detached. This change becomes more marked as the scene goes on. You haven't seen my glasses anywhere, have you, Jamie? You haven't seen them, have you, James? No, Mary. What's the matter with Jamie? Have you been nagging at him again? You should treat him with more. You should treat him with such contempt all the time. He's not to blame. If he'd been brought up in a real home, I'm sure he would be different. You're not much of a weather prophet, dear. See how hazy it's getting. I can hardly see the other shore. Yes, I spoke too soon. We're in for another night of fog, I'm afraid. Oh, well, I won't mind it tonight. No, I don't imagine you will, Mary. I don't see Jamie going down to the hedge. Where did he go? He's going with Edmund to the doctor's. He went up to change his clothes. 
I'd better do the same or I'll be late for my appointment at the club. He makes a move towards the front parlor doorway, but with a swift, (laughs) impulsive movement, she reaches out and clasps his arm. Don't go yet, dear, please. I don't want to be alone. I mean, you have plenty of time. You know, you boast you can dress in one tenth of the time it takes the boys. There's something I wanted to say. What was it? I've forgotten. I'm glad Jamie is going up to town. You didn't give him money, I hope. I did not. He don't be spend it on drinking, you know. You know what a vile, poisonous tongue he has when he's drunk. Not that I would mind anything he said tonight, but he always manages to drive you into a rage, especially if you're drunk too, as you will be. I won't. I never get drunk. <laughs> Oh, I'm sure you'll hold it well. You always have. It's hard for a stranger to tell, but after 35 years of marriage... I've never missed a performance in my life. That's the proof. If I did get drunk, it is not you who should blame me. No man has ever had a better reason. Reason? What reason? You always drink too much when you go to the club, don't you? Particularly when we meet McGuire, he sees to that. Oh, I don't think I'm finding fault, dear. You must do as you please. I won't mind. I know you won't. I've got to get dressed. No, please, please wait a little while, dear. At least, at least until one of the boys comes down. You'll all be leaving me soon. It's you who are leaving us, Mary. I? That's a silly thing to say, James. How could I leave? There's nowhere I could go. Who would I go to see? I have no friends. It's your own fault. There's surely one thing you can do this afternoon that will be good for you, Mary. Take a drive in the automobile, get away from the house, get a little sun and fresh air. I bought the automobile for you. You know I don't like the damn things. I'd rather walk any day or take a trolley. I had it here waiting for you when you came back from the sanatorium. I hoped it would give you pleasure and distract your mind. You used to ride in it every day, but you've hardly used it at all lately. I paid a lot of money I couldn't afford, and there's the chauffeur. I have to board and lodge and pay high wages whether he drives you or not. Ah, Waste. The same old waste that will land me in the poorhouse in my old age. What good did it do you? I might as well have thrown the money out the window. Yes, it was a waste of money, James. You shouldn't have bought a second-hand automobile. You were swindled again like you always are because you insist on second-hand bargains in everything. It's one of the best makes. Everyone says it's better than any of the new ones. It was another waste to hire Smythe, who was only a helper in the garage and had never been a chauffeur. Oh, I realize his wages are less than a real chauffeur's, but he's more than makes up for that, I'm sure, by the graft he gets from the garage on repair bills. Something is always wrong. Smythe sees to that, I'm afraid. I don't believe it. He may not be a fancy millionaire's flunky, but he's honest. You're as bad as Jamie suspecting everyone. (laughs) You mustn't be offended, dear. I wasn't offended when you gave me the automobile. I knew you didn't mean to humiliate me. I knew that was the way you had to do everything. I was grateful and touched. I knew buying a car would be a hard thing for you to do, and it proved how much you loved me in your way, especially when you couldn't really believe that it would do me any good. Mary. Dear Mary, for the love of God, for my sake and the boy's sake and your own, won't you stop now? I, James, please. Stop what? What are you talking about? James, we've loved each other. We always will. Let's remember only that and not try to understand what we cannot understand or help things that cannot be helped. The things life has done to us, we cannot excuse or explain. You won't even try. Try to go for a drive this afternoon, you mean? Why, yes, if you wish me to, although it makes me feel lonelier than if I stay here. There's no one I can invite to drive with me, and I never know where to tell Smith to go to. If there was a friend's house where I could drop in and laugh and gossip a while, 
but of course there never is, there never has been. Oh, at the convent I had so many friends, girls whose families lived in lovely homes. I used to visit them and they'd visit me in my father's home. But naturally, after I married an actor, who knows how actors were considered in those days, a lot of them gave me the cold shoulder. And then after we were married, there was that scandal of that woman who'd been your mistress suing you. From then on, all my old friends either pitied me or cut me dead. I hated the ones who cut me dead much less than the ones who pitied me. God's sake, don't dig up what's long forgotten. If you're that far gone in the past already, when it's only the beginning of the afternoon, what will you be tonight? Come to think of it, I do have to drive uptown. There's something I must get at the drugstore. I'll leave it to you to have some of the stuff hidden and prescriptions for more. I hope you'll lay in a good stock ahead so we'll never have another night like the one when you screamed for it and ran out of the house in your nightdress, half crazy, to try and throw yourself off the dock. I have to get tooth powder and toilet soap and cold cream. James, you mustn't remember. You mustn't humiliate me so. I'm sorry. Forgive me, Mary. Doesn't matter. Nothing like that ever happened. You must have dreamt it. I was so healthy before Edmund was born. You remember, James? There wasn't a nerve in my body. Even traveling with you season after season, if week after week of one night stands in trains without pullments, in dirty rooms of filthy hotels, eating bad food, bearing children in hotel rooms, I still kept healthy. Bearing Edmund was the last straw. I was so sick afterwards, and that ignorant quack of the cheap hotel doctor, all he knew was I was in pain. It was easy for him to stop the pain. Mary, for God's sake, forget the past. Why? How can I? The past is the present, isn't it? It's the future, too. We all try to lie out of that, but life won't let us. I blame only myself. I swore after Eugene died, I would never have another baby. I was to blame for his death. I hadn't left him with my mother to join you on the road because you wrote telling me you missed me and you were so lonely. Jamie would never have been allowed to, when he had still had the measles to go into the baby's room. I've always believed Jamie did that on purpose. He was jealous of the baby. He hated him. Oh, I know Jamie was only seven, but he was never stupid. He'd been warned he might kill the baby. He knew. I've never been able to forgive him for that. Are you back with Eugene now? Can't you let our dead baby rest in peace? It was my fault. I should have insisted on staying with Eugene and not have let you persuade me to join you just because I loved you. Above all, I shouldn't have let you insist I have another baby to take Eugene's place because you thought that might make me forget his death. I knew from experience by then that children should have homes to be born in if they're to be good children, and women need homes if they're to be good mothers. I was afraid all the time I carried Edmund. I knew something terrible would happen. I knew it proved by the way I'd left Eugene that I wasn't worthy to have another baby and that God would punish me if I did. I never should have born Edmund. Mary, be careful with your talk. If he heard you, he might think you never wanted him. He's feeling bad enough already without- It's a lie. I did want him more than anything in the world. Oh, you don't understand. I meant for his sake. He has never been happy. He never will be, nor healthy. He was born nervous and too sensitive, and that's my fault. Now, ever since he's been so sick, I kept remembering Eugene and my father, and I've been so frightened and guilty. Oh, I know it's foolish to imagine dreadful things when there's no reason for it. After all, everyone has colds and gets over them. Tyrone stares at her and sighs helplessly. He turns away towards the front parlor and sees Edmund coming down the stairs in the hall. Here's Edmund. For God's sake, try and be yourself, at least until he goes. You can do that much for him. 
He waits, forcing his face into a pleasantly paternal expression. She waits frightenedly, seized again by a nervous panic, her hands fluttering over the bosom of her dress, up to her throat and hair, with a distracted aimlessness. Then, as Edmund approaches the doorway, she cannot face him. She goes swiftly away to the windows at left and stares out with her back to the front parlor. Edmund enters. He has changed to a ready-made blue serge suit, high stiff collar and tie, black shoes. Well, you look spick and span. I'm on my way up to change too. Uh, wait a minute, Papa. I hate to bring up disagreeable topics, but there is the matter of car fare. I'm broke. You'll always be broke until you learn the value. But you've been learning, lad. You worked hard before you took ill. You've done splendidly. I'm proud of you. He pulls out a small roll of bills from his pants pocket and carefully selects one. Edmund takes it. He glances at it, and his face expresses astonishment. His father again reacts customarily, sarcastically. Thank you. How sharper than a serpent's tooth it is. To have a thankless child. I, I know. Give me a chance, Papa. I'm not speechless. This isn't a dollar. It's a ten spot. Put it in your pocket. You'll probably meet some of your friends uptown, and you can't hold your end up and be sociable with nothing in your jeans. You meant it? Gosh, thank you, Papa. <laughs> Why all of a sudden? Doc Hardy tell you I was going to die? No, that that that's a rotten crack. I, I was only I was only kidding, Papa. I was only kidding. <laughs> I'm very grateful, honest, Papa. I'm really grateful. You're welcome, lad. <laughs> I won't have it. Do you hear, Edmund? Such morbid nonsense, saying you're going to die. It's those books you read. Nothing but sadness and death. Your father shouldn't allow you to have them. Some of those poems you've written yourself are even worse. You think you didn't want to live. Boy, if you were age with everything before him, it's just a pose to get out of books. You're not really sick at all. Mary, hold your tongue. But James, it's absurd of Edmund to be so gloomy and make such a great to-do about nothing. Never mind, dear. I'm on to you. You want to be petted and spoiled and made a fuss over. Isn't that right? You're still such a baby. Please don't take it too far, dear. Don't, don't say horrible things. I, I know it's foolish to take them seriously, but I can't help it. You've got me so frightened. Don't. Don't, Mama. Uh -huh. Don't, Mama. Maybe if you asked your mother now what you said you were going to. Oh, my God, look at the time. I'll have to shake a leg. He hurries away through the front parlor. Mary lifts her head. Her manner is again one of detached <laughs> motherly solicitude. Oh, she seems to have forgotten the tears which are still in her eyes. How do you feel, dear? Oh, your head is a little hot, but that's just from going out in the sun. You look ever so much better than you did this morning. Come and sit down. You mustn't stand on your feet for too so much. You must learn to husband your strength. Listen, Mama... Now, now, don't talk. Lean back and rest. You know, I think it would be much better for you if you stayed home this afternoon and let me take care of you. Such a tiring trip uptown to that dirty old trolley on a hot day like this. I'm sure you'd be much better off here with me. You forget I have an appointment with Doc Hardy. Listen, Mama. You, you can telephone and say you don't feel well enough. Simply a waste of time and money seeing him. He'll only tell you some lie. He'll pretend he's found something serious that matter because that's his bread and butter. That old idiot. <laughs> All he knows about medicine is to look solemn and preach willpower. Mama, please listen. I want to ask you something. You... You only just started... You can still stop. You've got the willpower. We'll all help you. I'll do anything. Won't you, Mama? Please, don't talk about things you don't understand. 
All right. I give up. I knew it was no use. Anyway, I don't know what you're referring to. No, you should be the last one. Right after I returned from the sanitarium, you began to be ill. The doctor there warned me I must have peace at home with nothing to upset me, and, and all I've done is worry about you. Oh, oh, but, but that's no excuse. I'm only trying to explain. It's not an excuse. Promise me, dear, you won't believe that I made you an excuse. What else can I believe? <laughs> yes, I suppose you can't help suspecting that. <laughs> and what do you expect? Nothing. I don't blame you. How could you believe me when I can't believe myself? a liar. I never learned about anything once upon a time. Now I have to lie, especially to myself, but how can you understand when I don't myself? I never understood anything about it except that one day long ago I found I could no longer call my soul my own. But someday, dear, I will find it again. Someday when you're all well and I see you healthy and happy and successful. And I don't have to feel guilty anymore. Someday when the Blessed Virgin Mary forgives me and gives me back my faith in her love and pity I used to have in my convent days. And I can pray to her again when she sees no one in the world can believe me even for a moment anymore. Then she will believe in me and with her help it will be so easy. I will hear myself scream with agony at the same time. I will laugh because I will be so sure of myself. Of course, you can't believe that either. Now I think of it, you might as well go uptown. I forgot I'm taking a drive. I have to go to the drugstore. You would hardly want to go there with me. You'd be so ashamed. Mama, don't. I suppose you'll divide that $10 your father gave you with Jamie. You always divide with each other, don't you? Like good sports. Well, I know what he'll do with his share. Get drunk someplace where all he can be is with the only kind of woman he understands or likes. And <coughs> promise me you won't drink. It's so dangerous. You know, Dr. Hardy told you. I thought he was an old idiot. Anyway, by tonight, what will you care? Edmund! Come on, kid, let's beat it. Go on, Edmund. Jamie's waiting. There comes your father downstairs, too. Come on, Edmund. Coming. Goodbye, Mama. Oh, goodbye, dear. If you're coming home for dinner, try not to be late and tell your father. You know what Bridget is. He turns and hurries away. Tyrone calls from the hall. And then Jamie. Goodbye, Mama. Goodbye. The front screen door is heard closing after them. She comes and stands by the table, one hand drumming on it, the other fluttering up to pat her hair. She stares about the room with frightened, forsaken eyes and whispers to herself. So lonely here. <laughs> You're lying to yourself again. You wanted to get rid of them. Their contempt and disgust aren't pleasant company. You're glad they're gone. The mother of God, why do I feel so lonely? Curtain. Act three. Scene. The same. It is around half past six in the evening. Dusk is gathering in the living room. An empty, uh, an early dusk due to the fog, which has rolled in from the sound. And it's is like a white curtain drawn down the outside, out, drawn down outside the windows. From a lighthouse beyond the harbor's mouth, a foghorn is heard at regular intervals, moaning like a mournful wail in labor. 
and from the harbor itself, intermittently, comes the warning ringing of bells on yachts at anchor. The tray with the bottle of whiskey, glasses, and pitcher of ice water is on the table, as it was in the pre-luncheon scene of the previous act. Mary and the second girl, Kathleen, are discovered. The latter is standing at left of table. She holds an empty whiskey glass in her hand, as if she'd forgotten she had it. She shows the effects of drink. Her stupid, good-humored face wears a pleased and flattered simper. Mary is paler than before, and her eyes shine with unnatural brilliance. The strange detachment in her manner has intensified. She has hidden deeper within herself and found res refuge and release in a dream where present reality is but an appearance to be accepted and dismissed unfeelingly, even with hard cynicism, or entirely ignored. There is, at times, an uncanny, gay, free youthfulness in her manner, as if in spirit she were released to become again, simply and without self-consciousness, the naive, happy, chattering schoolgirl of her convent days. She wears the dress into which she had changed for her drive to town, a simple, fairly expensive affair, which would be extremely becoming if it were not for the careless, almost slovenly way she wears it. Her hair is no longer fastidiously in place. It has a slightly disheveled, lopsided look. She talks to Kathleen with a confiding familiarity, as if the second girl were an old, intimate friend. As the curtain rises, she is standing by the screen door looking out. A moan of the foghorn is heard. That foghorn, isn't it awful, Kathleen? Oh, it is indeed, ma'am. It's like a banshee. I don't mind it tonight. Last night it drove me crazy. I lie awake wor worrying until I couldn't stand it anymore. Bad cess to it. I was scared out of my wits riding back from town. I thought that ugly man's smile would drive us into a ditch or against a tree. You couldn't see your hand in front of you. I'm glad you had me sit back with you, ma'am. If I'd been in the front with him, he, he can't keep his dirty hands to himself. Give him half the chance and he's pinching me on the leg or you know where, asking your pardon, madam, but, but it's true. It wasn't the fog I minded, Kathleen. I really love fog. Well, they say it's good for the complexion. It hides you from the world and the world from you. You feel that everything has changed and nothing is what it seemed to be. No one can find you or touch you anymore. I wouldn't care so much if Smith was a fine, handsome man like some chauffeurs I've seen. I mean, I mean, if it's all if if it was all in fun and for I'm a decent girl, but for a shriveled runt like Smith, Smythe, I've told him, <laughs> I've told him. You must think I'm hard up to notice a man like you. I've warned him one day I'll give, I'll give a clout that'll knock him into the next week. And so I will. The foghorn I hate. I have left you alone. Keeps reminding you, warning you, and calling you back. But it can't tonight. It's just an ugly sound. Doesn't remind me of anything. Except perhaps <laughs> Mr. Tyrone snores. I've always had such fun teasing him about it. He has snored ever since I can remember, especially when he's had too much to drink. And yet he's like a child. He hates to admit it. <laughs> well, I suppose I, I suppose I snore sometimes too, and I don't like to admit it. So I have no right to make fun of him, have I? Ah, sure, everybody healthy snores. It's a sign of sanity, they say. What time is it, ma'am? I, I ought to be back in the kitchen. The damp is in Bridget's rheumatism and she's raging like a devil. She'll bite my head off. She puts her glass on the table and makes a movement towards the back parlor. No, don't go, Kathleen. I, I don't want to be alone yet. It won't be for long. The master and the boys will be home soon. I, I doubt if they'll come home for dinner. They have too good an excuse to remain in the bar rooms while they feel at home. Don't worry about Bridget. I'll tell her I kept you with me and you can take a big drink of whiskey to her when you go. She won't mind then. No, ma'am. 
That's the one thing that will make her cheerful. She loves her drop. Have another drink yourself if you wish, Kathleen. I don't know if I better, ma'am. I, I can feel what I've had already. Well, maybe one more won't harm. She pours a drink. Here's to your good health, ma'am. She drinks without bothering about a chaser. Oh, I really did have good health once, Kathleen. That was long ago. The months are sure to notice what's gone from the bottle. Got the eye of a hawk for that. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll play Jamie's trick on him. Just measure a few drinks of water and pour them in. <laughs> God save me, it'll be half water. He'll know by the taste. Oh, no. By the time he comes home, he'll be too drunk to tell the difference. He's just such a good excuse, he believes, to drown his sorrows. Well, it's a good man's failing. I wouldn't give Tron... Tron... Tr I wouldn't give a Tronine for a teetotaler. They've no, they've no high spirits. Good excuse. You mean Mr. Edmund, ma'am? I can tell the master's worried about him. <sighs> Don't be silly, Kathleen. Why should he be? A touch of grip is nothing. And Mr. Tyrone is worried about anything. Never, never is worried about anything except money and property and the fear he'll end his days in poverty. I mean, deeply worried because he cannot really understand anything else. <laughs> oh, my husband is a very peculiar man, Kathleen. Well, he's a fine and handsome and kind gentleman, just the same man. Never mind his weakness. Oh, I don't mind. I've loved him dearly for 36 years. That proves I know he's lovable at heart and I can't help being what he is, doesn't it? That's right, ma'am. Love him dearly, for any fool can see how he worships the ground you walk on. Speaking of acting, ma'am, how is it you never went on the stage? I? What put that absurd notion in your head? I was brought up in a respectable home and educated in the best convent in the Middle West. Before I met Mr. Tyrone, I hardly knew there was such a thing as a theater. I was a very pious girl. I even dreamed of becoming a nun. I've never had the slightest desire to become an, act an actress. Well, I can't imagine you as a holy nun, ma'am. Sure, you're never dark in the door of a church, God forgive you. I've never felt at home in the theatre, even though Mr. Tyrone has made me go with him on all of his tours. I've had little to do with the people of his company, or they with me, or with anyone on the stage. Not that I have anything against them. They've been very kind to me and I to them. But I've never felt at home with them. Their life is not my life. I've always stood between me and... Uh, let's not talk of old things that couldn't be helped. How thick the fog is. I can't see the road. All the people in the world could pass by and I would never know. I wish it was like that way. It's getting dark already. It'll be soon at night, thank goodness. It was kind of you to keep me company this afternoon, Kathleen. I would have been so lonely driving uptown alone. Oh, sure, wouldn't I rather ride in a fine automobile than stay here and listen to Bridget's lies about her relations? It was like a vacation, ma'am. It was only one thing I didn't like. What was that, Kathleen? The way the man in the drugstore acted when I took the prescription for you. The impotent, the impotence of him. What are you talking about? What drugstore? What prescriptions? Oh, of course, I'd forgotten. The medicine for my rheumatism in my hands. What did the man say? Not that it matters as long as he filled the prescription. It matters to me, then. I'm not used to being treated like a thief. He gave me a long look and said insultingly, where'd you get a hold of this? And I said, it's none of your damn business. But if you must know, it's for the lady I work for, Mrs. Tyrone, who's sitting out in the automobile. That shut him up quick. He gave a look out to you and said, oh, I'm going to get the medicine. Yes, he knows me. It's a special kind of medicine. I have to take it because there's no other that can stop the pain, all the pain, I mean, in my hands. Your hands. You'd never believe it, but these were once one of my good points, along with my hair and my eyes, and I, I had a fine figure too. 
They were musicians' hands. I used to love to play the piano. I worked so hard at my music in the convent. If you can call it work when you do something that you love. Mother Elizabeth and my music teacher both said that I had more talent than any student that they remembered. My father paid for special lessons. He spoiled me. He would do anything I asked. He would have sent me to Europe to study after I graduated from the convent. I might have gone if I hadn't met, fallen in love with Mr. Tyrone. Or I might have become a nun. I had two dreams to be a nun. That was the more beautiful one. And to become a concert pianist. That was the other one. I haven't touched the piano in so many years. I couldn't play with such crippled fingers, even if I wanted to. For a time after my marriage, I kept trying to keep up my music, but it was hopeless. One night stands, cheap hotels, dirty trains, leaving children, never having a home. Oh, see Kathleen, how ugly they are. So maimed and crippled. You'd think you'd been through some horrible accident. <laughs> oh, so they have come to think of it. I won't look at them. They're worse than the foghorn for reminding me. But even they can't touch me now. They far away. I see them, but the pain is gone. You've taken some of the medicine. It's made you act funny, man. If I didn't know any better, I, I think you'd, you'd have dropped taken. Feels the pain. You go back until at last you're beyond its reach. Only the past where you were happy is real. If you think Mr. Tyrone is handsome now, Kathleen, you should have seen him when I first met him. He had the reputation of being one of the finest looking men in the country. The girls in the convent who had seen him act or seen his photograph used to rave about him. He was a great matinee idol then, you know. Women used to wait at the stage door just to see him come out. You can imagine how excited I was when my father wrote to tell me that he and James Tyrone had become friends and that I was to meet him when I came home for Easter vacation. I showed the letter to all the girls and how envious they were. My father took me to see him at the act first. It was a play about the French Revolution and the leading part was a noble man. I couldn't take my eyes off him. I wept when he was thrown in prison and then I was so mad at myself because I was afraid my eyes and my nose would be red. And my father had said that we'd go backstage to his dressing room and after the play and so we did. <laughs> I was so bashful, I couldn't stammer and blush like a little fool. But he didn't seem to think I was a fool. I know he liked me the first moment we were introduced. I guess my eyes and my nose couldn't have been that red after all. I was really very pretty then, Kathleen. And he was handsomer than my wildest dreams in his makeup and his nobleman's costume that was so becoming to him. He was different from ordinary, ordinary men, like someone from another world. But at the same time, he was simple and kind and unassuming, <clears throat> not a bit stuck up or vain. I fell in love right then. So did he, he told me afterwards. I forgot all about becoming a nun or a concert pianist. All I wanted was to be his wife. 36 years ago, and I could see it as clearly as if it were tonight. We've loved each other ever since. And in all those 36 years, there's never been a breath of scandal about him. I mean, with any other woman, never since he met me. That has made me very happy, Kathleen. It has made me forgive so many other things. He's a fine gentleman, and you're a lucky woman. Can I take a drink to Bridget, ma'am, near dinner time, and I ought to be in the kitchen helping her. If she doesn't, get something to quit her temper, she'll be after me with the cleaver. Yes, yes, go, I don't need you now. Thank you, ma'am. She pours out a big drink and starts for the back parlor with it. You won't be alone long. The master and the boys are... Um... Oh, no, no, they won't come. Tell Bridget I won't wait. You can serve dinner promptly at half past six. I'm not hungry, but I'll sit at the table and we'll get it over with. You have to eat something, ma'am. It, it, it's a queer medicine if it takes away your appetite. What medicine? 
I don't know what you mean. You better take that drink to Bridget. Yes, ma'am. She disappears through the back parlor. Mary waits until she hears the pantry door close behind her. Then she settles back in relaxed dreaminess, staring fixedly at nothing. Her arms rest limply along the arms of the chair, her hands with long, warped, swollen-knuckled, sensitive fingers drooping in complete calm. It is growing dark in the room. There is a pause of dead quiet. Then, from the world outside, comes the melancholy moan of the foghorn, followed by a chorus of bells muffled by the fog from the anchored craft in the harbor. Mary's face gives no sign she has heard, but her hands jerk and the fingers automatically play for a moment on the air. She frowns and shakes her head mechanically, as if a fly had walked across her mind. She suddenly loses all the girlish quality and is an aging, cynically sad, embittered woman. You're a sentimental fool. What's so wonderful about the first meeting between a silly romantic schoolgirl and a matinee idol? You were much happier before you knew he existed in the convent where you used to play, pray to the Blessed Virgin. If only I could find the faith I lost so I could pray again. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. You expect the Blessed Virgin to be pooled by a lying dope fiend reciting words. You can't hide from her. Uh, I must go upstairs. I haven't taken enough. When you start again, you never know exactly how much you need. She goes towards the front parlor, then stops in the doorway as she hears the sound of voices from the front path. She starts guiltily. Then... She hurries back to sit down. Her face sets in stubborn defensiveness. Why do they come back? They don't want to, and I'd much rather be alone. (sighs) I'm so glad they've come. I've been so horribly lonely. The front door is heard closing, and Tyrone calls uneasily from the hall. Are you there, Mary? The light in the hall is turned on and shines through the front parlor to fall on Mary. I'm here, dear, in the living room. I've been waiting for you. Tyrone comes in through the front parlor. Edmund is behind him. Tyrone has had a lot to drink, but beyond a slightly glazed look in his eyes and a a trace of blur in his speech, he does not show it. Edmund has also had more than a few drinks without much apparent effect, except that his sunken cheeks are flushed and his eyes look bright and feverish. They stop in the doorway to stare appraisingly at her. What they see fulfills their worst expectations. But for the moment, Mary is unconscious of their condemning eyes. She kisses her husband and then Edmund. Her manner is unnaturally effusive. They submit shrinkingly. She talks excitedly. So happy you've come. I had had given up hope. I was afraid you wouldn't come home. Such a dismal, foggy evening. It must have been so much cheerful, more cheerful in the barrooms uptown where there are people you can talk to and joke with. No, don't deny it. I know how you feel. I don't blame you a bit. I'm all the more grateful for you to coming for coming home. I was sitting here so lonely and blue. Come and sit down. She sits at left rear of table, Edmund at left of table, and Tyrone in the rocker at right of it. Don't, dinner will be ready for won't be ready for a minute. You're actually a little early. Will wonders never cease? Use the whiskey, dear. Shall I pour a drink for you? And you, Edmund? I don't want to encourage you, but one before dinner as an appetizer can't do any harm. She pours a drink for him. They make no move to take the drinks. She talks on as if unaware of their silence. Where's Jamie? But of course he's never come home so long as he has the price of a drink left. I'm afraid Jamie has been lost to us for a long time, dear. But we mustn't allow him to drag Edmund down with him, as he's likely to do. He's jealous because Edmund has always been the baby, just as he used to be of Eugene. He'll never be content until he makes Edmund as hopeless a failure as he is. Stop talking, Mama. Yes, Mary, the less you say now. All the same, there's truth in your mother's warning. Beware of that brother of yours, or he'll poison life for you with his damned sneering serpent's tongue. I'll cut it out, Papa. It's hard to believe seeing Jamie now. 
as he is now, that he was ever the baby. Do you remember what a healthy, happy baby he was, James? The one night stands, the filthy trains, the cheap hotels and the bad food never made him cross or sick. He was always smiling or laughing. He hardly ever cried. Eugene was the same too, happy and healthy during the two years he lived before I let him die through my neglect. Oh, for the love of God, I'm a fool for coming home. Papa, shut up. It was Edmund who was the cross patch when he was little, always getting upset and frightened about nothing at all. Everyone used to say, dear, you'd cry at the drop of a hat. Maybe I guess there was a good reason not to laugh. Now, now, lad, you know better than to pay attention. Who would have thought Jamie would grow? Who would have thought Jamie would grow up to disgrace us? You remember James? For years after he went to boarding school, we received such glowing reports. Everyone liked him. All his teachers told us what a fine brain he had and how easily he learned his lessons. Even after he began to drink and they had to expel him, they wrote us how sorry they were because he was so likable and such a brilliant student. They predicted a wonderful future for him if he would only learn to take his life more seriously. Oh, such a pity. Poor Jamie. Hard to understand. No, it isn't at all. You brought him up to be a boozer. Since his since he first opened his eyes, he's seen you drinking. Oh, there's a bottle on the bureau in the cheap hotel rooms. And if he had a nightmare when he was little or a stomach ache, your remedy was to give him a teaspoonful of whiskey to keep him quiet. So I'm to blame because that lazy hulk has made a drunken loafer of himself? Is that what I came home to listen to? I might have known. When you have the poison in you, you want to blame everyone but yourself. Papa. He told me not to pay attention. Anyway, it's true. He did the same thing with me. I can remember that teaspoonful of booze every time I woke up with a nightmare. Yes, you were continually having nightmares as a child. <clears throat> you were born afraid because I was so afraid to bring you into the world. Oh, please don't think I blame your father, Edmund. He didn't know any better. He never went to school after he was 10. His people were the most ignorant kind of poverty stricken Irish. I'm sure they honestly believed whiskey is the healthiest medicine for a child who's sick or frightened. Papa! Papa! Are we going to have this drink or aren't we? You're right. I'm a fool to take notice. Drink hearty, lad. Edmund drinks, but Tyrone remains staring at the glass in his hand. Edmund at once realizes how much the whiskey has been watered. He frowns, glancing from the bottle to his mother, starts to say something, but stops. Uh, I'm I'm sorry if I sounded bitter, James. I'm not. It's all so far away, but I did feel a little hurt when you wished you hadn't come home. I was so relieved and happy when you came and grateful to you. It's really dreary and sad to be here alone in the fog with the night falling. I'm glad I came, Mary, when you act like your real self. I was so lonesome. I kept Kathleen with me just to have someone to talk to. Oh, do you know what I was telling you, dear? About the night my father took me to your dressing room and I first fell in love with you. Do you remember? Can you think I'd ever forget, Mary? No. I know you still love me, James, in spite of everything. Yes, as God is my judge. Always and forever, Mary. And I love you, dear, in spite of everything. But I must confess, James, although I couldn't help loving you, I would never have married you if I'd known such, you drank so much. I remember the first night and our barroom friends had to help you up to the door of our hotel room, knocked and they ran away before I came to the door. We were still on our honeymoon, do you remember? I don't remember. It wasn't on our honeymoon. And I never in my life had to be helped to bed or missed a performance. Oh, I had waited in that ugly hotel room hour after hour. I kept making excuses for you. I told myself it must be some business connected with the theatre. I knew so little about the theatre. Then I became terrified. I imagined all sorts of horrible accidents. I got on my knees and prayed that nothing had happened to you. And then they brought you up and left you outside the door. Oh, I didn't know how, how often that was going to happen in the years to come. 
how many times I was to wait in ugly hotel rooms. I became quite used to it. Christ, no wonder. What is dinner, Mama? Must be time. Yes, it must be. Let's see. Mary, can't you forget? No, dear. But I forgive. I always forgive you. Don't look so guilty. I'm sorry I remembered out loud. I don't want to be so sad or to make you sad. I want to remember only the happy part of the past. You remember our wedding, dear? I'm sure you've completely forgotten that my, what my wedding gown looked like. Men don't notice such things. They don't think they're important. But it was important to me, I can tell you, how I fussed and worried. I was so excited and happy. My father told me to buy anything I wanted and never mind what it cost. The best is none too good, he said. I'm afraid he spoiled me dreadfully. My mother didn't. She was very pious and strict. I think she was a little jealous. She didn't approve of my marrying, especially an actor. I think she hoped I would be a nun. She used to scold my father. She'd grumble, you never let me, never mind me the cost when I buy something. You've spoiled that girl, so I pity her husband if she ever marries. She'll expect him to give me the moon and she'll never make a good wife. <laughs> oh, poor mother. Oh, but she was mistaken, wasn't she, James? I haven't been such a bad wife, have I? I'm not complaining, Mary. At least I've loved you dearly and done the best I could under the circumstances. That wedding gown was nearly the death of me and the dressmaker too. <laughs> I was so particular, I was never quite good enough. At last she said she refused to touch it anymore I thought she might spoil it. And I made her leave so I could be alone to examine it myself in the mirror. I was so pleased and vain. I thought to myself, even your nose and your mouth and your ears are a trifle too large. Your eyes and your hair and your figure and your hands make up for it. You're just as pretty as any actress he's ever met. And you don't have to use paint. Where's my wedding gown now, I wonder? I kept it wrapped up in tissue paper in my trunk. I used to hope I would have it for my daughter. And when it came time for her to marry, she couldn't have bought a lovelier gown. And I knew James, you'd never tell her, never mind the cost. You'd want her to pick up something as a bargain. It was made of soft, shimmering satin, trimmed with wonderful old duchesse lace and tiny ruffles around the neck and sleeves and worked into the folds with draped around the bustle effect at the back. Basque was boned and very tight. I remember I held my stomach up when it was fitted so my waist would be as small as possible. Oh, my father even let me have Duchess lace on my white satin slippers and lace with the orange blossom on my veil. Oh, how I love that gown. It was so beautiful. Oh, but now I wonder. I used to take it out from time to time when I was lonely, but it always made me sad. So I finally, a long time ago, I did. I wonder where I hid it. Probably one of those old trunks up in the attic. Someday I'll have to look. Isn't it dinner time, dear? You're forever scolding me for being late, but now I'm on time for once. It's dinner that's late. Well, if I can't eat yet, I can drink. I'd forgotten I had this. He drinks his drink. Edmund watches him. Tyrone scowls and looks at his wife with sharp suspicion. Who's been tampering with my whiskey? The damn stuff is half water. Jamie's been away and he wouldn't even overdo his trick like this. Anyway, any fool could tell. Mary, answer me. I hope to God you haven't taken a two Shut up, on top Papa. Of you treated Kathleen and Bridget, isn't that it, Mama? Yes, of course. They work hard for poor wages and I'm the housekeeper. I have to keep them from leaving. Besides, I wanted to treat Kathleen because I had her drive uptown with me and sent her to get my prescription filled. For God's sake, Mama. You can't trust her. Do you want everyone on Earth to know? No, what? 
that I suffer from rheumatism in my hands and have to take medicine to kill the pain? Why should I be ashamed of that? I never knew what rheumatism was before you were born. Ask your father. Don't mind her, lad. It doesn't mean anything. When she gets to the stage where she gives the crazy, the old crazy excuse about her hands, she's gone far away from us. I'm glad you realize that, James. Now perhaps you'll give up trying to remind me, you and Edmund. Why don't you light the lights, James? It's getting dark. I know you hate to, but Edmund has proved to you that one bulb burning doesn't cost much. You know, since letting your fear of the poor house make you too stingy. I never claimed one bulb cost much. It's having them on, one here and one there, that makes the electric light company rich. He gets up and turns on the reading lamp. But I'm a fool to talk reason to you. I'll get a fresh bottle of whiskey, lad, and we'll have a real drink. He goes through the back parlor. <laughs> oh, he'll sneak around to the outside cellar door so the servants won't see him. He's really ashamed of keeping his whiskey padlocked in the cellar. Your father's a strange man, Edmund. Many years before I understood him, you must try to understand and forgive him too and not feel contempt because he's closed-fisted. His father deserted his mother and their six children a year after they came to America. He told them he had a premonition he would die soon and he was homesick for Ireland and wanted to go back there to die. So he went back and did to die. He was a bit peculiar man too. Your father had to go to work in the machine shop when he was only 10 years old. For Pete's sake, Mama, I've heard Papa tell that machine shop story 10,000 times. Yes, dear, you've had to listen, but I don't think you've ever tried to understand. Listen, Mama, you're not so far gone yet you've forgotten everything. You haven't asked me what I found out this afternoon. Don't you care, damn? Don't say that. You hurt me, dear. What I've got is serious, Mama. Doc Hardy knows for sure now. That lying old quack. I warned you he'd invent something. He called in a specialist to examine me so he'd be absolutely sure. Don't tell me about Hardy. If you heard what that doctor at the sanatorium, who really knows something, said about you, he, what he, how he treated me. He said he ought to be locked up. He said it's a wonder I hadn't gone mad. I told him I once had. That time I ran down to my, my nitrous to throw myself off the dock. You remember that, don't you? And yet you want me to pay attention to what Doc Hardy says? Oh, no. I remember, all right. It was right after that Papa and Jamie decided they couldn't hide it from me anymore. Jamie told me. I called him a liar. I tried to punch him in the nose. But I knew he wasn't lying. God. It made everything in life seem rotten. Don't, my baby. You hurt me so dreadfully. I'm sorry, Mama. It was you who brought it up. Listen, Mama, I'm going to tell you whether you want to hear it or not. I've got to go to a sanatorium. Go away? No, I won't have it. How dare Dr. Harvey advise such a thing without consulting me? How dare your father allow him? What right has he? You are my baby. Let him attend to Jamie. I know why he wants to send you to a sanatorium to take you from me. He's always tried to do that. He's been jealous of every one of my babies. He kept finding ways to make you leave, make me leave them. That's what's called Eugene's death. He's been jealous of you most of all. He knew I loved you most because- Stop talking crazy, can't you, mama? Stop trying to blame him. It, it, why are you so against my going away now? I've been away a lot and I, I've never noticed it broke your heart. I'm afraid you're not very sensitive after all. You might have guessed, dear, that after I knew you knew about me, I had to be glad whenever you were where you were so you couldn't see me. Mama, don't. All this talk about loving me and you won't even listen when I try to tell you how sick I am. No, no that's enough. I don't care to hear because I know it's nothing but Hardy's ignorant lies. You're so like your father, dear. You love to make a scene out of nothing so you can become dramatic and tragic. 
I gave you the slightest encouragement. You tell me next you're going to die. People do die of it. Your own father. Why do you mention him? There's no comparison at all with you. He has consumption. <laughs> I hate you when you become gloomy and morbid. I forbid you to remind me of my father's death. Do you hear me? Yes, I hear you, Mama. I wish to God I didn't. It's pretty hard to take at times having a dope feed for a mother. Forgive me, Mama. I was angry. You hurt me. Oh. I listen to that awful foghorn and the bells. Why is it fog makes everything sound so sad and lost, I wonder? I can't stay here. I don't want any dinner. He hurries away through the front parlor. She keeps staring out the window until she hears the front door close behind him. Then she comes back and sits in her chair, the same blank look on her face. I must go upstairs. I haven't taken enough. I hope sometime without meaning it, I'll take an overdose. I never could do it deliberately. The blessed virgin would never forgive me then. She hears Tyrone returning and turns as he comes in through the back parlor with a bottle of whiskey he has just uncorked. He is fuming. The padlock is all scratched. That drunken loafer has tried to pick the lock with a piece of wire the way he's done before. Ah, but I fooled him this time. It's a special padlock a professional burglar couldn't pick. Where's Edmund? He went out. Perhaps he's gone uptown again to find Jamie. He, he still has some money left, I suppose, and it's burning a hole in his pocket. He said he didn't want any dinner. He doesn't seem to have any appetite these days, but it's just a summer cold. <sighs> oh, James, I'm so frightened. I know he's going to die. Don't say that, it's not true. They promised me in six months he'd be cured. You, you don't believe that. I can tell you're acting. It would be my fault. I should never have borne him. I should, I should have been better for his, it would have been better for his sake. I could never hurt him then. He wouldn't have had to know his mother was a dope fiend and, and hate her. Hush, Mary, for the love of God, he loves you. He knows it was a curse put on you without you knowing or willing it. He's proud you're his mother. Hush now, here comes Kathleen. You don't want her to see you crying. She turns quickly away from him to the windows at right, hastily wiping her eyes. A moment later, Kathleen appears in the back parlor doorway. She is uncertain in her walk and grinning woozily. Dinner is served, sir. Dinner is served, ma'am. So you're here, are you? Well, well. Won't Bridget be in a rage? Because I told her the madam said that you wouldn't be home. Don't be looking at me that way. If I have a drop taken, I didn't steal it. I was invited. She turns Hello. with huffy dignity and disappears through the back parlor. Come along, dear. Let's have our dinner. I'm hungry as a hunter. I'm afraid you'll have to excuse me, James. I couldn't possibly eat anything. My hands pain me so dreadfully. I think the best thing for me is to go and rest. Good night, dear. Up to take more of that goddamned poison, is that it? You'll be like a mad ghost before the night's over. I don't know what you're talking about, James. You say such mean, bitter things when you've drunk too much. You're as bad as Jamie or Edmund. She moves off through the front parlor. He stands a second as if not knowing what to do. He is a sad, bewildered, broken old man. He walks wearily off through the back parlor towards the dining room. Curtain. Act four. Scene, the same. It is around midnight. The lamp in the front hall has been turned out so that now no light shines through the front parlor. 
In the living room, only the reading lamp on the table is lighted. Outside, the windows, the wall of fog appears denser than ever. As the curtain rises, the foghorn is heard, followed by the ship's bells from the harbor. Tyrone is seated at the table. He wears his prince, uh, pince nez and is playing solitaire. He has taken off his coat and has on an old brown dressing gown. The whiskey bottle on the tray is three quarters empty. There is a fresh full bottle on the table, which he has brought from the cellar, so there will be an ample reserve at hand. He is drunk and shows it by the owlish, deliberate manner in which he peers at each card to make certain of its identity, and then plays it as if he weren't certain of his aim. His eyes have a misted, oily look, and his mouth is slack. But despite all the whiskey in him, he has not escaped, and he looks as he appeared at the close of the preceding act, a sad, defeated old man, possessed by hopeless resignation. As the curtain rises, he finishes a game and sweeps the cards together. He shuffles them clumsily, dropping a couple on the floor. He retrieves them with difficulty and starts to shuffle again when he hears someone entering the front door. He peers over his pince-nez through the front parlor. Who's that? Is it you, Edmund? Yes. Ah, Jesus! Turn that light out before you come in. But Edmund doesn't. He comes in through the front parlor. He is drunk now, too. But like his father, he carries it well and gives little physical sign of it except in his eyes and the chip-on-the-shoulder aggressiveness in his manner. Tyrone speaks at first with a warm, relieved welcome. I'm glad you've come, lad. I've been damned lonely. You're a fine one to run away and leave me to sit alone here all night when you know... I told you to turn out that light. We're not giving a ball. There's no reason to have the house ablaze with electricity at this time of night, burning up money. Ablaze with electricity. One bulb. Hell, everyone keeps a light on in the front hall until they go to bed. Damn, you're busting my knee on the hat stand. The light from here shows in the hall. You could see your way well enough if you were sober. <laughs> if I was sober, I like that. I don't give a damn what other people do. If they want to be wasteful fools for the sake of show, let them be. Ah, one bulb. Christ, don't be such a cheapskate. I've proved by figures if you light, if you left the light bulb on all night, it wouldn't be as much as one drink. The hell with your figures. The proof is in the bills I have to pay. <laughs> yes, facts don't mean a thing, do they? What you want to believe, that's the only truth. Shakespeare was an Irish Catholic, for example. So he was. The proof is in his plays. Well, he wasn't, and there's no proof of it in his plays, except to you. The Duke of Wellington, there was another good Irish Catholic. Well, I never said he was a good one. He was a renegade, but a Catholic, just the same. Well, he wasn't. You just want to believe no one but an Irish Catholic general could beat Napoleon. I'm not going to argue with you. I asked you to turn out that light in the hall. Yeah, I heard you. As far as I'm concerned, it stays on. None of your damned insolence. Are you going to obey me or not? Not! If you want to be a crazy miser, put it out yourself. Listen to me. I've put up with a lot from you because from the mad things you've done at times, I've thought you weren't quite right in your head. I've excused you and never lifted my hand to you. But there's a straw that breaks the camel's back. You will obey me and put out that light, or as big as you are, I'll give you a thrashing that'll teach you. <coughs> Forgive me, land. I... You shouldn't goad me into losing my temper. Forget it, Papa. I... I apologize, too. I had no right being nasty about nothing. I'm a bit soused, I guess. I'll put out the damned light. No, stay where you are. Let it burn. He stands up abruptly and a bit drunkenly and begins turning on the three bulbs in the chandelier with a childish, bitterly dramatic self-pity. We'll have them all on. Let them burn. To hell with them. The poor house is the end of the road, and it might as well be sooner as later. <laughs> That's a grand curtain. 
<laughs> You're a wonder, Baba. <laughs> That's right. Laugh at the old fool. The poor old ham. But the final curtain will be in the poorhouse just the same, and that's not comedy. Well, well, let's not argue. You've got brains in that head of yours, though you do your best to deny them. You live to learn the value of a dollar. You're not like your damned tramp of a brother. I've given up hope or he'll ever get sent. Where is he, by the way? How would I know? I thought you'd gone back uptown to meet him. No, I walked out to the beach. I haven't seen him since this afternoon. Well, if you split the money I gave you with him like a fool... Sure I did. He's always staked me when he had anything. Then it doesn't take a soothsayer to tell he's probably in the whorehouse. <laughs> what of it if he is? Why not? Why not, indeed? It's the fit place for him. If he's ever had a loftier dream than whores and whiskey, he's never shown it. Oh, for Pete's sake, Papa. If you're going to start that stuff, I'll beat it. All right, all right. Well, stop. God knows I don't like the subject either. Will you join me in a drink? Ugh. Now you're talking. I'm wrong to treat you. You've had enough already. Enough is not as good as a feast. It's too much in your condition. Forget my condition. Here's how. Drink hearty. If you walked all the way to the beach, you must be damp and chilled. I dropped in at the inn on the way back, on the way out and back. It's not a night I pick for a long walk. I love the fog. That's what I needed. You should have more sense than what to risk. Hell with sense. We're all crazy. What do we want with sense? They are not long. The weeping and the laughter, love and desire and hate. I think they have no portion in us after we pass the gate. They are not long, the days of wine and roses. Out of a misty dream, our path emerges for a while, then closes within a dream. Fog was where I wanted to be. Halfway down the path, you can't see this house. You'd never know it was here, or any of the other places down the avenue. I couldn't see but a few feet ahead. I, I didn't meet a soul, everything looked and sounded unreal. Nothing was what it is. It's what I wanted. To be alone with myself in another world where truth is untrue and life can hide from itself. Up beyond the harbor where the road runs along the beach, I even lost the feeling of being on land. The fog and the sea seemed part of each other. It was, it was like walking on the bottom of the sea, as if I had drowned long ago. As if I were a ghost belonging to the fog, and the fog was the ghost of the sea. It felt damned peaceful to be nothing more than a ghost within a ghost. Don't look at me like I've gone nutty. I'm talking sense. Who wants to see life as it is, if they can help it? It's the three gorgons in one. You look in their faces and turn to stone. Or it's Pan. You see him and you die. That is, inside you. And you have to go on living as a ghost. You have a poet in you, but it's a damned morbid one. Devil take your pessimism. I feel low-spirited enough. Why can't you remember your Shakespeare and forget the Third Raiders? You'll find what you're trying to say in him, as you'll find everything else worth saying. We are such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. Fine. That's, that's beautiful. But I wasn't trying to say that. We are such stuff as manure is made on. So let's drink up and forget it. That's my idea. Ugh, keep such sentiments to yourself. I shouldn't have given you that drink. But uh, did pack a wallop, all right. On you, too. Even if you've never missed a performance. But what's wrong with being drunk? It's what we're after, isn't it? Let's not kid each other, Papa, not tonight. We know what we're trying to forget. But let's not talk about it. It's no use now. No. 
all we can do is try to be resigned again. Or be so drunk you can forget. Be always drunken. Nothing else matters. That is the only question. If you would not feel the horrible burden of time weighing on your shoulders and crushing you to the earth, be drunken continually. Drunken with what? With wine, with poetry, with or with virtue, as you will. But be drunken. And if sometimes on the stairs of a palace, or on the green side of a ditch, or in the dreary solitude of your own room, you should awaken and the drunkenness be half or wholly slipped away from you, ask of the wind or of the wave or of the star or of the bird or of the clock of whatever flies or sighs or rocks or sings or speaks, ask what hour it is and the wind, wave, star, bird, clock will answer you. It is the hour to be drunken. Be drunken if you would not be martyred slaves of time. Be drunken continually with wine, with poetry, or with virtue, as you will. I wouldn't worry about the virtue part of it if I were you. <laughs> it's poor, poor nonsense. What, what little truth is in it you'll find nobly said in Shakespeare. But you recited it well, lad. Who wrote it? Baudelaire. Never heard of him. <laughs> he also wrote a poem about Jamie and the Great White Way. That loafer, I hope to God he misses the last car and has to stay uptown. Although he was French and never saw Broadway and died before Jamie was born. He knew him and little old New York just the same. <laughs> With heart at rest, I climbed the citadel's steep height and saw the city as from a tower. Hospital, brothel, prison, and such hells, where evil comes up softly like a flower. Thou knowest, O Satan, patron of my pain, not for vain tears I went up at that hour, but like an old, sad, faithful lecher, fain to drink delight of that enormous trawl whose hellish beauty makes me young again. Whether thou sleep with heavy vapors full, sodden with day, or new apparelled, stand in gold-laced veils of evening beautiful, I love thee, infamous city. Harlots and hunted have pleasures of their own to give. The vulgar herd can never understand. Morbid filth! Where the hell do you get your taste in literature? Filth and despair and pessimism. Another atheist, I suppose. When you deny God, you deny hope. That's the trouble with you if you get down on your knees. Yeah, it's a good likeness of Jamie, don't you think? Hunted by himself and whiskey. Hiding in a Broadway hotel with some fat tart. He likes some fat. Reciting Dowson Sonara to her. <laughs> All night upon my heart I felt her warm heart beat. Light night long within mine arms and love and sleep she lay. Surely the kisses of her bought red mouth were sweet, but I was desolate and sick of an old and sick of an old passion. When I awoke and found the dawn was grey, I have been faithful to thee, Sinara, in my fashion. And the poor fat burlesque queen doesn't get a word of it, but suspects he's be she's being insulted. And Jamie never loved any Sonara and was never faithful to a woman in his life, even in his own fashion. But he lies there, kidding himself he is superior and enjoys pleasures the vulgar herd can never understand. <laughs> it's nuts. It's completely nuts. <laughs> it's madness yet. If you'd get on your knees and pray, when you deny God, you deny sanity. Yeah, but who am I to feel superior? I've done the same damn thing, and it's no more crazy than Dowson himself, inspired by an absinthe hangover, writing it to a dumb barmaid who thought he was a poor crazy souse, and gave him the gates to marry a waiter. Ugh, oh, poor Dowson. Booze and consumption. Got him. Uh, perhaps it would be tactful of me to change the subject. Where you get your taste in authors. The damned library of yours. 
Voltaire, Rousseau, Schopenhauer, Nietzsche, Ibsen, atheists, fools, madmen, and your poets, this Dawson and this Baudelaire and Swinburne and Oscar Wilde and Whitman and Poe, whoremongers and degenerates. <laughs> when I have three good sets of Shakespeare there, you could read. They say he was a souse too. They lie. I don't doubt he liked his glass. It's a good man's failing. But he knew how to drink, so it didn't poison his brain with morbidness and filth. Don't compare him with the pack you've got in there. Your dirty Zola and your Dante Gabriel Rossetti who was a dope fiend. Perhaps it would be wise to change the subject. You can't accuse me of not knowing Shakespeare. Didn't I win five dollars from you once when you bet me I couldn't learn a leading part of his in a week? As you used to do in stock in the old days? I learned Macbeth and recited it letter perfect with you giving me the cues. That's true. So you did. Mm. Ah, it was a terrible ordeal. I remember hearing you murder the lions. Oh. I kept wishing I'd paid over the bet without making you prove it. <laughs> oh, did you hear? She's moving around. I was hoping she'd gone to sleep. Oh, forget it. How about another drink? When did Mama go to bed? Right after you left. She wouldn't eat any dinner. What made you run away? Nothing. Well, here's how. Drink hearty, lad. I'm moving around a lot. I hope she doesn't come down. Yes. She'll be she'll be nothing but a ghost haunting the past by this time. Back before I was born. Doesn't she do the same with me? Back before she ever knew me. You think the only happy days she's ever known were in her father's home or at the convent? Praying and playing the piano. As I told you before, you must take her memories with a grain of salt. Her wonderful home was ordinary enough. Her father wasn't the great, generous, noble Irish gentleman she makes out. He was a nice enough man, good company, and a good talker. I liked him, and he liked me. He was prosperous enough, too, in his wholesale grocery business, an able man. But he had his weakness. She condemns my drinking, but she forgets his. It's true, he never touched a drop until he was 40, but after that, he made up for lost time. He became a steady champagne drinker, the worst kind. That was his grand pose, to drink only champagne. Well, it finished him quick. That, and the consumption. We don't seem to be able to avoid unpleasant topics, do we? No. What do you say to a game or two of casino, lad? All right. You can't lock up and go to bed till Jamie comes out on that last trolley, which I hope you won't. And I don't want to go upstairs anyway till she's asleep. Neither do I. Uh, as I was saying, you must take her tales of the past with a grain of salt. The piano playing and her dreaming of becoming a concert pianist, that was part, that was put in her head by the nuns flattering her. She was their pet. They loved her for being so devout. They don't know that not one in a million who shows promise ever rises concert playing. Not that your mother didn't play well for a schoolgirl, but that's no reason to take it for granted she could have... Why don't you deal if we're going to play? Yeah, I am. And the idea that she might have become a nun, that's the worst. Your mother was one of the most beautiful girls you could ever see. She knew it, too. She was a bit of a rogue and a coquette, God bless her, behind all her shyness and blushes. She had never made to renounce the world. She was bursting with health and high spirits and the love of loving. For God's sake, Papa, why don't you pick up your hand? Uh, let's see what I have here. Listen. She's coming downstairs. We'll play our game. Pretend not to notice. And she'll soon go up again. I don't see her. She must have started down and then turned back. Thank you. Yes. It's pretty horrible to see her the way she must be now. And the hardest thing, the hardest thing to take is the blank wall she builds around her. Or it's more like a bank of fog in which she hides and loses herself. Deliberately. That's the hell of it. 
You know, something in her does it deliberately to get beyond our reach, it, to be rid of us, to forget we're alive. It, it's as if, in spite of loving us, she hated us. No, no, lad, it's not her. It's the damned poison. And she takes it to get that effect. At least I know she did this time. My play isn't it? Here. She's been terribly frightened about your illness for all her pretending. Don't be too hard on her, lad. Remember, she's not responsible. Once that cursed poison gets a hold on anyone. No, it should, should never have gotten a hold on her. I know damned well she's not to blame. And I know who is. You are. Your damned stinginess. If you'd spent money, if you'd spent money for a decent doctor when she was so sick after I was born, she'd never have known morphine existed. Instead, you put her in the hands of a hotel quack who wouldn't admit his ignorance and took the easiest way out, not giving a damn what happened to her afterwards, all because his fee was cheap. Another one of your bargains. Be quiet! How dare you talk of something you know nothing about? You must try to see my side of it too, that How was I to know he was that kind of a doctor? He had a good reputation. Among the souses in the hotel bar, I suppose. That's a lie. I asked the hotel proprietor to re recommend the best. Yes. At the same time, crying poor house and making it plain, you wanted a cheap one. I know your system. By God, I ought to after this afternoon. What about this afternoon? Well, never mind now. We're talking about Mama. I've, I'm saying no matter how you excuse yourself, you know damned well your stinginess is to blame. Didn't I say you're a liar? Shut your mouth right now. Or... And, and after you found out she'd been made a morphine addict, why didn't you send her to a cure then, at the start, while she still had a chance? No. That would have meant spending some money. I bet you told I bet you told her all she had to do was use a little willpower. That's what you still believe in your heart, in spite of what doctors who really know something about it have told you. You lie again. I know better than that now, but how was I to know then? What did I know of morphine? It was years before I discovered what was wrong. I thought she'd never got over her sickness, that's all. Why didn't I send her to a cure, you say? Haven't I? I've spent thousands upon thousands in cures. A waste. What good have they done her? She always started again. Because you've never given her anything that would help her want to stay off it. No home. Except this summer dump. In a place she hates. And you've refused even to spend money to make this look decent. While you keep buying more property. And playing sucker for every con man with a gold mine or a silver mine or any kind of get witch quick swindle. You've dragged her around on the road season after season on one night stands with no one she could talk to, waiting night after night in dirty hotel rooms for you to come back with a bun on after the bars closed. Christ, is it any wonder she didn't want to be cured? Jesus, when I think of it, I hate your guts. Benjamin! <laughs> How dare you talk to your father like that, you insolent young cub, after all I've done for you? We'll come to that, what you're doing for me! Will you stop repeating your mother's crazy accusations, which she never makes unless it's the poison talking? I never dragged her on the road against her will. Naturally, I wanted her with me. I loved her. And she came because she loved me and wanted to be with me. That's the truth, no matter what she says when she's not herself. And she needn't have been lonely. There was always the members of my company to talk to if she'd wanted. She had her children, too, and I insisted, in spite of the expense, on having a nurse to travel with her. Yeah, yes, your one generosity. And that because you were jealous of her paying too much attention to us and wanted her out of your way. It was another mistake, too. If she'd had to take care of me all by herself and had that to occupy her mind, maybe she'd have been able... Maybe oh, she'd have been able... that matter, you, if you insist on judging things by what she says when she's not in her right mind, if you hadn't been born, she'd never... Sure. I know that's what she feels, Papa. She doesn't. She loves you as dearly as ever mother loved a son. I only said that because you put me in such a goddamn rage. 
breaking up the past and saying you hate me. I didn't mean it, Papa. <laughs> I'm like Mama. I can't help liking you. In spite of everything. I might say the same of you. You're no great shakes as a son. It's a piece of a poor thing, but mine own. <laughs> <laughs> well, whose game? What happened to our game? Whose play is it? It's yours, I guess. You mustn't let yourself be too downhearted, lad, by the bad news you had today. Both the doctors promised me if you obey orders at this place you're going, you'll be cured in six months or a year at most. Don't kid me. You don't believe that. Of course I believe it. Why shouldn't I believe it when both Hardy and the specialists... You think I'm going to die. That's a lie. You're crazy. So, why waste money? That's why you're sending me to a state farm up in I don't know, God knows what where. state farm? It's the Hilltown Sanatorium. That's all I know. And both doctors said it was the best place for you. For the money. That is, for nothing. Or practically nothing. Don't lie, Papa. You know damned well Hilltown Sanatorium is a state institution. Jamie suspected you'd cry poor house to Hardy, and he wormed the truth out of him. That drunken loafer. I'll kick him out in the gutter. He's poisoned your mind against me ever since you were old enough to listen. Now you can't deny it's the truth about the state farm, can you? It's not true the way you look at it. What if it is run by the state? That's nothing against it. The state has the money to make a better place than any private sanatorium. And why shouldn't I take advantage of it? It's my right and yours. We're residents. I'm a property owner. I help to support it. I'm taxed to death. Yes, I'm property valued at a quarter of a million. Right. It's all mortgaged. Hardy and the specialists know what you're worth. I wonder what they thought of you when you when they heard you moaning poor house and showing you wanted to wish me on charity. That's a lie. All I told them was I couldn't afford any millionaire sanatorium because I was land poor. That's the truth. And then you went to the club to meet McGuire and let him stick you with another bum piece of property. Don't right. lie about it. We met McGuire in the in the hotel bar after he left you. Jamie kidded him about hooking you, and he winked and laughed. He's a liar, if he said. Then don't lie about it! Papa. Ever since I went out to sea and was on my own and found out what hard work for little pay was and what it felt like to be broke and starve and camp on park benches because I had no place to sleep, I've tried to be fair to you. Because I knew what you'd been up against as, as a kid. I've tried to make allowances. Christ, you have to make allowances in this damned family or go nuts. I've tried to make allowances for myself when I, I remember all the rotten stuff I've pulled. I've tried to feel like Mama that you can't help being what you are where money is concerned. But God almighty, this last stunt of yours is too much! It makes me want to puke. You know, not because of the rotten way you're treating me. To hell with that. I've, I've treated you rottenly in my way more than once. But to think, when it's a question of your own son having consumption, you can show yourself up before the whole town as such a stinking old tightwad. Don't you know Hardy will talk and the whole damn town will know? Jesus, Papa! Haven't you any pride? Or shame? And don't think I'll let you get away with it. No, I won't go to any damn state farm just to save you a few lousy dollars to buy more bum property with, you stinking old miser! Quiet. Don't say that to me, you're drunk. I won't mind you. Stop coughing, lad. You got yourself worked up over nothing. You said you had to go to this Hilltown place. You can go anywhere you like. I don't give a damn what it costs. All I care about is to have you get well. Don't call me a stinking miser just because I don't want doctors to think I'm a millionaire they can swindle. 
Bad. You'd better make a barista. <laughs> Thanks. <sighs> Who's playing this? Thinking old miser. Well, maybe you're right. Maybe I can't help being. Although, all my life since I had anything, I've thrown money over the bar to buy drinks for everyone in the house. Or loaned money to sponges. I knew it would never pay it back. But of course, that was in bar rooms when I was full of whiskey. I can't feel that way about it when I'm sober in my home. I was at home. It was at home I first learned the value of a dollar and the fear of the poorhouse. I've never been able to believe in my luck since. I've always feared it would change and everything I had would be taken away. But still, the more property you own, the safer you think you are. That may not be logical, but it's the way I have to feel. Banks fail and your money's gone, but you think you can keep land beneath your feet. You said you realized what I'd been up against as a boy. The hell you do. How could you? You have had everything. Nurses, schools, college, though you didn't stay there. You've had food, clothing. Oh, I know you had a fling of hard work with your back and hands, a bit of being homeless and penniless in a foreign land. And I respect you for it. But it was a game of romance and adventure to you. It was play. Yes, particularly the time I tried to commit suicide at Jimmy the priest and almost did. You weren't in your right mind. No son of mine would ever... <sighs> you were drunk. I was stone cold sober. That was the trouble. I'd stopped to think for too long. Don't start your damned atheist morbidness again. I don't care to listen. I was trying to make plain to you. What do you know about the value of a dollar? When I was 10, my father deserted my mother and went back to Ireland to die, which he did soon enough and deserved to. And I hope he's roasting in hell. He mistook wrath poison for flour or sugar or something. There was gossip. It wasn't my by mistake, but that's a lie. No one in my family ever. My bet is it wasn't by mistake. More morbidness. Your brother put that in your head. The worst he can expect is suspect is the only truth for him, but never mind. My mother was left a stranger in a strange land with four small children. Me and a sister, a little older and two younger than me. My two older brothers had moved to other parts. They couldn't help. They were hard put to keep it to, hard put to it to keep themselves alive. There was no damn romance in our poverty. Twice we were evicted from the miserable hovel we called home, with my mother's few sticks of furniture thrown out in the streets, and my mother and sisters crying. I cried too, though I tried hard not to because I was the man of the family. At 10 years old, there was no more school for me. I worked 12 hours a day in a machine shop learning to make files. A dirty barn of a place where rain dripped through the roof, where you roasted in summer and there was no stove in winter and your hands got numb with cold, where the only light came through two small filthy windows. So on gray days, I'd have to sit bent over with my eyes, almost touching the files in order to see. You talk of work. But what do you think I got for it? 50 cents a week. It's the truth. 50 cents a week. And my poor mother washed and scrubbed for the Yanks by the day. And my older sister sewed and my two younger stayed at home to keep the house. We never had clothes enough to wear, nor food enough to eat. Well, I remember one Thanksgiving, or maybe it was Christmas, when some yank and whose house mother had been scrubbing gave her a dollar extra for a present, and on the way home, she spent it all on food. I can remember her hugging and kissing us and saying with tears of joy running down her tired face, glory be to God, and for once in our lives, we'll have enough for each of us. A brave, fine, sweet woman. There never was a braver or finer. Yes, uh, she must have been. The one fear was she'd get old and sick and have to die in the poorhouse. It was in those days I learned to be a miser. The dollar was worth so much then. And once you've learned a lesson, it's hard to unlearn it. You have to look for bargains. If I took this state farm sanatorium for a good bargain, you'll have to forgive me. The doctors did tell me it's a good place. You must believe that, Edmund. And I swear, I never meant you to go there if you didn't want to. You can choose any place you like. Never mind what it costs. Any place I can afford. Any place you like, within reason. 
there was another sanatorium the specialist recommended. He said it had a record as good as any place in the country. It's endowed by a group of millionaire factory owners for the benefit of their workers principally, but you're eligible to go there because you're a resident. There's such a pile of money behind it, they don't have to charge much. It's only $7 a week, but you get 10 times that value. I don't want to persuade you to anything. Understand, I'm simply repeating what I was told. Oh, I know that. Sounds like a good bargain to me. Yeah, I'd like to go there. So that settles that. Doesn't matter a damn now anyway. Let's forget it. How about our game? Uh, whose play is it? I don't know. Mine, I guess. No, it's yours. Yeah. And maybe life overdid the lesson for me and made a dollar worth too much. And the time came when that mistake ruined my career as a fine actor. I've never admitted this to anyone before, lad, but tonight I'm so heartsick I feel at the end of everything. And what's the use of fake pride and pretense? That goddamn play I bought for a song and made such a great success in, a great money success. It ruined me with its promise of an easy fortune. I didn't want to do anything else, and by the time I woke up to the fact I'd become a slave to the damned thing and did try other plays, it was too late. They had identified me with that one part and didn't want me in anything else. They were right, too. I'd lost the great talent I once had through years of easy repetition, never learning a new part, never working really hard. Thirty-five to forty thousand dollars net profit a season, like snapping your fingers. It was too great a temptation. Yet before I bought the damned thing, I was considered one of the three or four young actors with the greatest artistic promise in America. I'd worked like hell. I'd left a good job as a machinist to take super parts because I loved the theater. I was wild with ambition. I read all the plays ever written. I studied Shakespeare as you'd study the Bible. I educated myself. I got rid of an Irish brogue you could cut with a knife. I love Shakespeare. I would have acted in any of his plays for nothing, for the joy of being alive in his great poetry. And I acted well in him. I felt inspired by him. I could have been a great Shakespearean actor if I'd kept on. I know that. In 1874, when Edwin Booth came to the theater in Chicago where I was leading man, I played Cassius to his Brutus one night, Brutus to his Cassius the next, Othello to his Iago and so on. The first night I played Othello, he said to our manager, that young man is playing Othello better than I ever did. Uh, that's from Booth, the greatest actor of his day or any other. And it was true. And I was only 27 years old. As I look back on it now, that night was the high spot in my career. I had life where I wanted it. And for a time after that, I kept on upward with ambition high. Married your mother. Ask her what I was like in those days. Her love was an added incentive to ambition. And a few years later, my good luck, good bad luck made me find the big moneymaker. It wasn't that in my eyes at first. It was a great romantic part. I knew I could play better than anyone. But it was a great box office success from the start. And then life had me where it wanted me. At from 35 to 40,000 net profit a season, a fortune in those days, or even in these. <sighs> what the hell was it I wanted to buy, I wonder? What was worth? Well, no matter. It's a late day for regrets. My play, isn't it? Um, I'm glad you told me this, Papa. I know you a lot better now. Maybe I shouldn't have told you. Maybe we'll only feel more contempt for me. And it's a poor way to convince you of the value of a dollar. Well, the glare from those extra lights hurts my eyes. You don't mind if I turn them out, do you? We don't need them, and there's no use making the electric company rich. No, sure, sure not. Just yeah, turn them out. But, um, I don't know what the hell it is I wanted to buy. 
In my small amount, Edmund, I'd gladly face not having an acre of land to call my own, nor a penny in the bank. I'd be willing to have no home but the poor house of my old age if I could look back down on having been the fine artist I might have been. <laughs> What the devil are you laughing at? No, not at you, Papa. But life. It's so damn crazy. More of your morbidness. There's nothing more wrong with life. It's we who... The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves that we are underlings. The praise that Edwin Booth gave my fellow. I made the manager put down his exact words in writing. I kept it in my wallet for years. I used to read it every once in a while until finally it made me feel so bad I didn't want to face it anymore. Where is it now, I wonder? Somewhere in this house. I remember I put it away carefully. It might be in an old trunk in the attic, along with Mama's wedding dress. For Pete's sake, if we're going to play cards, let's play. You know? He takes the card his father has played and leads. For a moment... They play the game like mechanical chess players. Then Tyrone stops, listening to a sound upstairs. She's still moving around. God knows when she'll go to sleep. For Christ's sake, Papa, forget it. He reaches out and pours a drink. Tyrone starts to protest, then gives it up. Edmund drinks. He puts down the glass. His expression changes. When he speaks, it is as if he were deliberately giving way to drunkenness and seeking to hide behind a maudlin manner. Yes, she moves above and beyond us, a ghost haunting the past. And here we sit, pretending to forget, but straining our ears, listening for the slightest sound, hearing the fog drip from the eaves like the uneven tick of a run-down crazy clock. Or like the dreary tears, like the dreary tears of a trollop spattering in a puddle of stale beer on a honky-tonk tabletop. <laughs> it's not so bad, that last, eh? Original, not Baudelaire. Hey, give me credit. You just told me some high spots in your memories. Want to hear mine? They're all connected with the sea. Here's one. When I was on the square head square rigger, bound for Buenos Aires, full moon in the trades, the old hooker driving 14 knots, I lay on the bowsprit facing astern, with the wave, the water, foaming into spume under me. The masts with every sail, white in the moonlight, towering high above me, I became drunk. <laughs> drunk with the beauty and singing rhythm of it. And for a moment, I lost myself. Actually lost my life. Now I was set free. I dissolved in the sea, became white sails and flying spray, became beauty and rhythm, became moonlight and the ship and the high dim starred sky. I belonged, a past or future within peace and unity and a wild joy within something greater than my own life, or the life of man, to life itself, to God, if you want to put it that way. Then, then another time on the American line, when I was lookout on the crow's nest in the dawn watch, a calm sea that time, only a lazy ground swell and a, and a low, slow, drow drowsy roll of the ship. The passengers asleep and none of the crew in sight. No sound of man. Black smoke pouring from the funnels behind and beneath me. Dreaming, not keeping lookout, feeling alone and above and apart. 
watching the dawn creep like a painted dream over the sky and sea which slept together. Then the moment of ecstatic freedom came, the peace, the end of the quest, the last harbor, the joy of belonging to a fulfillment beyond man's lousy, pitiful, greedy fears and hopes and dreams. And several other times in my life when I was swimming far out or lying alone on a beach, I have had the same experience. Became the sun, the hot sand, green seaweed anchored to a rock swaying in the tide like a saint's vision of beatitude. Like the veil of things as they seem drawn back by an unseen hand. For a second, you see, seeing the secret are the secrets. For a second, there is meaning. Then the hand lets the veil fall, and you are alone, lost in the fog again, and you stumble on toward nowhere for no good reason. It was a great mistake, my being born a man. I would have been much more successful as a seagull or a fish. As it is, I will always be a stranger who never feels at home, who does not really want and is not really wanted, who can never belong, who must always be a little in love with death. Yes, there's the makings of a poet in you, all right. But that's morbid craziness about not being wanted and loving death. The makings of a poet, no. I'm afraid I'm like the guy who's always panhandling for smoke. He hasn't even got the makings. He's got only the habit. I couldn't touch what I tried to tell you just now. I just stammered. That's the best I'll ever do, I mean, if, if I live. Well, it will be faithful realism, at least. Stammering is the native eloquence of us fall people. Pause. Then they both jump startledly, as if there is a noise from outside the house, as if someone had stumbled and fallen on the front steps. Well, that sounds like the absent brother. He must have a peach of a bun on The loafer, he caught the last car. Bad luck to it. Ah, get him to bed, Edmund. I'll go out on the porch. He has a tongue like an adder when he's drunk. I'd only lose my temper. He goes out the door to the side porch as the front door in the hall bangs shut behind Jamie. Edmund watches with amusement Jamie's wavering progress through the front parlor. Jamie comes in. He is very drunk and woozy on his legs. His eyes are glassy, his face bloated, his speech blurred his mouth slack like his father's, a leer on his lips. What ho! <laughs> what ho! It's on a loud noise. Oh, hello, kid. I'm drunk as a fiddler's bitch. Thanks for telling me your great secret. Yes. Unnecessary information number one, May. Eh? Oh, I had a serious accident. The front steps tried to trample on me. Took advantage of fog to waylay me. Ought to be a lighthouse out there. It's dark in here, too. What the hell is this, a morgue? Let's have some lights on this subject. Ford, Ford, O Cobble River. Ford, O Cobble River in the dark. Keep the crossing stakes beside you, and they will surely guide you. Cross the Ford O'Cobble River in the dark. He fumbles at the chandelier and manages to turn on the three bulbs. That's more like it. 
<laughs> to hell with old Gaspard. Where is that old tight one? Out on the porch. Can't expect us to live in the black hole of Calcutta. His eyes fix on the full bottle of whiskey. Say, have I got the DTs? <clears throat> My God, it's real. What's the matter with the old man tonight? Must be ossified to forget that he left this out. Grab opportunity by the forelock. It's key to my success. You're stinking now. That'll knock you stiff. Wisdom from the mouth of babes. Can the wise stuff, kid. You're still wet behind the ears. Mm, all right. Pass out if you want to. Okay. That's the trouble. I had enough to sink a ship, but can't sink. Well, here's hoping. Yeah, shove over the bottle. I'll have one, too. No, you don't. Not while I'm around. Remember doctor's orders. Maybe no one else gives a damn if you die, but I do. My kid brother. I love your guts, kid. Everything else is gone. You're all I've got left. So, no booze for you, if I can help it. Um, uh, give me a moment. I've got another blank page here. I will just switch over to a play page that is not blank. Just give me a moment. This is up. Up. Yep, 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 yep. Hold on, everybody. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Um... Ooh, do, 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 Yep, you're, uh... <laughs> you're awfully tranquil right now for such a drunkard, Jamie. Appreciate it. Um, yep, you never tell her, never mind the cost. Yep, up, 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 Um... Edmund turned to page 160. Yes, thank you. Thank you, voice from above. Um... Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, ba, 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 ba. uh oh nearly there nearly there nearly there and here's Jamie thank you okay thank you uh, ba, 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 ba. all right so uh no booze for me eh come on <laughs> lay off it you don't believe I care eh Nice. Just drunken bull. All yeah. right. Go ahead and kill yourself. Sure, I know you care, Jamie. I'm going on the wagon. But tonight, doesn't count. Too many damned things have happened today. Here's how. I know, Kate. It's been a lousy day for you. I bet old Gaspard hasn't tried to keep you off booze. <laughs> Probably give you a case to take with you to the state farm for pauper patients. The sooner you kick the bucket, the less expense. What a bastard to have for a father. Christ, if you put him in a book, no one would believe it. Oh, Papa's all right if you try to understand him and keep your sense of humor. Mm, he's been putting on the old sob act for you, eh? He can always kid you, but not me. Never again. Although, in a way, I do feel sorry for him about one thing. But he has even that coming to him. He is to blame. What the hell with that? <laughs> that last drink's getting me. This one here will put the lights out. Did you tell Gaspard I got out uh, to Doc Hardy? This sanatorium is a charity dump. Yes, I told him I wouldn't go there. It's all settled now. He said I can go anywhere I want. Within reason, of course. Oh, of course, lad. Anything within reason. That means another cheap dump. Old Gaspar, the miser in the bells. That's a party you can play without makeup. Shut up, will you? I've heard that Gaspard stuff a million times. All right. If you're satisfied, let him get away with it. 
That's your funeral. I mean, I hope it won't be. Right. And what did you do uptown tonight? Did you go to Mamie Burns? <laughs> Sure thing. Where else could I find a suitable feminine companionship and love? But don't forget love. What is a man without a good woman's love? A goddamn hollow shell. You are a nut. <laughs> then, turning to my love, I said, The dead are dancing with the dead. The dust is whirling with the dust, but she, she heard the violin and left my side and entered in. Love passed into the house of lust. Then suddenly the tune went false. The dancers wearied of the waltz. It was not strictly accurate. If my love was with me, I didn't notice it. She must have been a ghost. With one of Mamie's charmers, I picked to bless me with her woman's love. I'll hand you a laugh, kid. I picked Fat Violet. <laughs> no! Honest? <laughs> Some pick? God, she weighs a ton! What the hell for? A joke? <laughs> no, joke. No, very serious. By the time I hit Mamie's dump, I felt very sad about myself and all the other poor bums in the world, ready for a weep on any old womanly bosom. You know how you get when John Barleycorn turns on the soft music inside your head. Then, as soon as I got in the door, Mamie began telling me all her troubles. Beefed how rotten business was, and, and she was going to give Fat Violet the gate. <laughs> Customers didn't fall for Vi. Only reason she kept her was she could play the piano. <laughs> Lately, Vi's gone on drunks and been too boiled to play. And, and she was eating her out of house and home. And although Vi was a good-hearted dumbbell and she felt sorry for her because she didn't know how the hell she'd make a living. Still, business was business. And she couldn't afford to run a home for fat tarts. Well, that made me feel very sorry for fat Vi. So I squandered two bucks of your dough to escort her upstairs with no dishonorable intentions, whatever. I like them fat, but not that fat. All I wanted was a little heart to heart talk concerning the infinite sorrows of life. Oh, poor Vi. I'll bet you recited Kipling and Swinburne and Dalston and gave her, I have been faithful to thee, Sonara, in my fashion. Sure. <laughs> With the old master John Barleycorn playing soft music. She stood it for a while. Now well, then she got good and sore. Got the idea. I took her upstairs for a joke. Gave me a great bawling out, said she was better than a drunken bum who recited poetry. And then she began to cry. So I had to say I loved her because she was fat. And she wanted to believe that. And I stayed with her to prove it. And that cheered her up. And... She kissed me when I left and said she'd fallen hard for me. And we both cried a little more in the hallway. And everything was fine. Except Mamie Burns thought I'd gone bug house. Harlots and hunted have pleasures of their own to give. The vulgar herd can never understand. Exactly. Hell of a good time at that. You should have stuck around with me, kid. Mamie Burns inquired after you. Sorry to hear you're sick. She meant it, too. Well, this night has opened my eyes to a great career in store for me, my boy. I shall give the art of acting back to the performing seals, which are its most perfect expression, by applying my natural God-given talents in their proper sphere. I shall attain the pinnacle of success. 
I'll be the lover of fat women in Barnum and Bailey's circus. <laughs> Imagine me stunk into a fat girl in a hick town hooker shop. Me? Who've made some of the best lookers on Broadway sit up and beg? Speaking in general, I've tried them all. The happy roads that take you o'er the world. Not so apt. Happy roads is bunk. Weary roads is right. Get to nowhere fast. That's where I've got. Nowhere. Where everyone lands in the end. Even if most of the suckers won't admit it. Can it? Maybe crying in a minute. Don't. Don't get fresh. But you're right. <laughs> to hell with repining. Fat Violet's a good kid. Glad I stayed with her. It's a Christian act. Cured her blues. Hell of a good time. You should have stuck with me, kid. Take your mind off your troubles. What's the use coming home to get blues over? What can't be helped? All over. It's finished now. Not a hope. If I were hanged on the highest hill, mother of mine, oh mother of mine, I know whose love would follow me still. Shut up. Where's the hop head? Gone to sleep? Edmund jerks as if he'd been struck. There's a tense silence. Edmund's face looks stricken and sick. Then in a burst of rage, he springs from his chair. You dirty bastard! He punches his brother in the face with a blow that glances off the cheekbone. For a second, Jamie reacts pugnaciously and half rises from his chair to do battle. But suddenly he seems to sober up to a shocked realization of what he has said and sinks back limply. Thanks. Kid, I certainly had that coming. I don't know what made me... Who's talking? You know me, kid. I know. You'd, you'd never say that unless... God, Jamie, no matter how drunk... It's no excuse! I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry I hit you. I. You and I, we never scrapped that bad. <sighs> it's all right. I'm glad you did. My dirty tongue. I'd like to cut it out. <laughs> I suppose it's because I feel so damn sunk. Because this time Mama had me fooled. I really believe she had it late. She thinks I always believe the worst, but this time I believe the best. I suppose I can't forgive her. Yet meant so much. I'd begun to hope if she'd beaten the game, I could too. I, I, God, I don't I know how you feel. Stop it, Jamie. No, I've, I've known about Mama so much longer than you. Never forget that the first time I got wise I caught her in the act with a hypo. Christ, I'd never dreamed that any woman but a horse took dope. And then this stuff of you getting consumption, it's got me licked. We've been more than brothers. You're my only pal I've ever had. I love your guts. I'd do anything for you. I know that, Jamie. Yet, I'll bet you've heard Mama and old Gaspard spill so much bunk about my hoping for the worst. You suspect right now I'm thinking to myself that Papa is old and can't last, last much longer. And if you were to die, Mama and I would get all that he's got. And so I'm probably hoping shut up, shut that up, he's... you damn fool. What the hell put that in your nut? 
Yes, that's what I'd like to know. What, what put that in your mind? Don't be a dumbbell. What I said, always suspected of hoping for the worst, I, I got so I can't help. What are you trying to do? Accuse me? Don't play the wise guy with me. I've learned more of life than you'll ever know just because you read a lot of highbrow junk. Don't make you think you can fool me. You're only an overgrown kid. Mama's baby and Papa's pet. The family white hope. You've been getting swelled head lately about nothing. About a few poems in a Hicktown newspaper. Hell, I used to write better stuff for the Lit Magazine in college. You better wake up. You're setting no rivers on fire. You let Hicktown boobs flatter you with bunk about your future. Hell, kid, forget it. That goes for Sweeney. You know, I, I don't mean it. No one hopes more than I do that you'll knock them all dead. No one is prouder. You've started to make good. And why shouldn't I be proud? <laughs> Hell, it's purely selfish. You reflect credit on me. I've had more to do with bringing you up than anyone. I wise you up about women so you'd never be a fall guy or make any mistakes you didn't want to make. And who steered you on to reading poetry first? Swinburne, for example? I did. But because I once wanted to write, I planted in your mind that someday you write. Hell, you're more than my brother. I made you. You're my Frankenstein. All right. I'm your Frankenstein. So let's have a drink. You crazy nut. I'll have a drink. Not you. Gotta take care of you. Don't be afraid of the sanatorium business. Hell, you can beat that standing on your head. Six months, and you'll be in the pink. Probably haven't even got consumption at all. Doctors, a lot of fakers. Told me a year ago to cut out the booze or I'd soon be dead, and here I am. All con men. Anything to grab your dough. I'll bet this State Farm stuff is political graft game. Doctors get a cut from every patient they send. You're, you're the limit. At the last judgment, you'll be around telling everyone it's in the bag. And I'll be right. Slip a piece of change to the judge and be safe. But if you're broke, you can go to hell. <laughs> Therefore, put money in thy purse. That's the only dope. This is the secret of my success. Look what it's got me. Listen, kid. You'll be going away. May not get another chance to talk. Or might not be drunk enough to tell you the truth. So I gotta tell you now something I ought have told you long ago for your own good. It's not drunken bull, but in vino veritas stuff. You better take it seriously. I wanna warn you against me. Mama and Papa are right. I've been rotten, bad influence. And worst of it is, I did it on purpose. Shut up. No, no, I, I don't want to no, hear No, next, next kid, you listen. I did it on purpose to make a bum of you. Or part of me did. A big part. That's the part that's been dead so long, that hates life, 
Am I putting you wise so you learn from my mistakes? I believe that myself at times, but it's fake. Made my mistakes look good. Made getting drunk romantic. Made whores fascinating vampires instead of poor, stupid, disease slobs they really are. Made fun of work as suckers game. Never wanted you succeed and make me look even worse by comparison. Wanted you to fail. Always jealous of you. Mama's baby, Papa's pet. And it was your being born that started Mama on dope. I know that's not your fault, but all the same, God damn you. I can't help hating your guts. No, oh, Jesus, Jamie, no, cut it out. Cut it no, out. No, but don't get me wrong, kid. No, but I love you more than I hate you. My saying what I'm telling you now proves it. I run the risk you'll hate me, and you're all I've got left. But I didn't mean to tell you that last stuff. Go that far back. I, I don't know what made me. What I wanted to say is I'd like to see you become the greatest success in the world. But you better be on your guard because I'll do my damnedest to make you fail. I can't help it. I hate myself. And I gotta take revenge on everyone else, especially you. Oscar Wilde's Reading Jail had that dope twisted. The man was dead, and so he had to kill the thing he loved. That's what it ought to be. The dead part of me hopes you won't get well. Maybe he's even glad the game has got mama again. He wants company. He doesn't want to be the only one around, the only corpse in this house. Jesus, Jamie, you really have <laughs> gone crazy. Well, think it over and you'll see I'm right. Think it over when you're away from me in the sanatorium. Make up your mind you've got to Tie a can to me. Get me out of your life. Or think of me as dead. Tell people, I had a brother, but he's dead. And when you come back, look out for me. I'll be waiting to welcome you with that my old pal stuff and give you the glad hand that the first good chance, I'll stab you in the back. Shut up. I'll be goddamned if I'll listen to you anymore. Only don't forget me. Remember, I warned you for your sake. Give me credit. Greater love hath no man than this, that he saveth his brother from himself. That's all. Feel better now. Gone to confession. I know you absolve me, don't you, kid? You understand. You're a damn fine kid. Ought to be. I made you. So go and get well. Don't die on me. You're all I've got left. God bless you, kid. Oh, that last drink. The old kale. He falls into a drunken doze, not completely asleep. Edmund buries his face in his hands miserably. Tyrone comes in quietly through the screen door from the porch, his dressing gown wet with fog, the collar turned up around his throat. His face is stern and disgusted, but at the same time pitying. Edmund does not notice his entrance. And God is asleep. I thought he'd never stop talking. We'd better let him stay here where he is and sleep it off. I heard the last part of his talk. It's what I warned you. I hope you'll heed the warning. Now it comes from his own mouth. But don't take it too much to heart, lad. 
He loves to exaggerate the worst of himself when he's drunk. He's devoted to you. It's the one good thing left in him. A sweet spectacle for me, my firstborn, who I hoped would bear my name and honor and dignity, who showed such brilliant promise. Keep quiet, can't you, Papa? A waste, a wreck, drunken hulk, done with and finished. He drinks. Jamie has become restless, sensing his father's presence struggling up from his stupor. Now he gets his eyes open to blink up at Tyrone. The latter moves back a step defensively, his face growing hard. Clarence has come. False, fleeting, perjured Clarence that stabbed me in a field by Tewksbury. Seize on him, furies. Take him into torment. What the hell are you staring at? Look in my face. My name is Might Have Been. I am also called No More, Too Late. Farewell. I'm well aware of that, and God knows I don't want to look at it. I got an idea for you, Papa. Put on a revival of the bells this season. There's a great part in it you can play without makeup. Old Gaspar the Miser. Shut up, Jamie. Shut I claim up. Edwin Booth never saw the day when he could give as good a performance as a trained seal. Seals are intelligent and honest, and they don't put up any bluffs about the art of acting. They admit that they're just hams earning their daily fish. You loafer. Papa, do you want to start a row that'll bring Mama down? Jamie, go back to sleep. You've shut off your mouth enough for one day. All right, kid. I'm not looking for an argument. It's too damn sleepy. He closes his eyes, his head nodding. Tyrone comes to the table and sits down, turning his chair so he won't look at Jamie. At once, he becomes sleepy, too. To God, she'd go to bed so that I could, too. I'm dog-tired. I can't stay up all night like I used to. Getting old and finished. (sighs) I can't keep my eyes open. I think I'll catch a few winks. Why don't you do the same, Edmund? It'll pass the time until she... His voice trails off. His eyes close. His chin sags. And he begins to breathe heavily through his mouth. Edmund sits tensely. He hears something and jerks nervously forward in his chair staring through the front parlor into the hall. He jumps up with a hunted, distracted expression. It seems for a second he is going to hide in the back parlor. Then he sits down again and waits, his eyes averted, his hands gripping the arms of his chair. Suddenly, all five bulbs of the chandelier in the front parlor are turned on from a wall switch, and a moment later someone starts playing the piano in there the opening of one of Chopin's simpler waltzes, done with a forgetful, stiff-fingered groping, as if an awkward schoolgirl were practicing it for the first time. Tyrone starts to wide awakeness and sober dread, and Jamie's head jerks back and his eyes open. For a moment, they listen frozenly. The playing stops as abruptly as it began, and Mary appears in the doorway. She wears a sky-blue dressing gown over her nightdress, dainty slippers with pom-poms on her bare feet. Her face is paler than ever. Her eyes look enormous. They glisten like polished black jewels. The uncanny thing is that her face now appears so youthful. Experience seems ironed out of it. It is a marble mask of girlish innocence, the mouth caught in a sly, a shy smile. Her white hair is braided in two pigtails, which hang over her breast. Over one arm, carried neglectfully, trailing on the floor, as if she had forgotten she held it, is an old-fashioned white satin wedding gown, trimmed with duchess lace. She hesitates in the doorway, glancing round the room, her forehead puckered puzzledly, 
like someone who has come to a room to get something but has become absent-minded on the way and forgotten what it was. They stare at her. She seems aware of them merely as she is aware of other objects in the room, the furniture, the windows, familiar things she accepts automatically as naturally belonging there, but which she is too preoccupied to notice. The mad scene, enterophilia. Good boy, Edmund, the dirty blaggard, his own mother. All right, kid, I had it coming, but I told you how much I hoped. I'll kick you out in the gutter tomorrow, so help me God. Jamie, for the love of God, <laughs> stop it. I play so badly now. I'm all out of practice. Sister, Sister Teresa will give me such a scolding. She'll tell me it isn't fair to my father when he spends so much money for extra lessons. She's quite right, it isn't fair. And when he's so good and generous and so proud of me. I'll practice every day from now on. It's something, something horrible has happened to my hands. The fingers have gotten so stiff. Those are all swollen. They're so ugly. I'll have to go to the infirmary and show Sister Martha. She's old and a little cranky, but I love her just the same. And she has things in her medicine chest that cure anything. She'll give me something to rub on my hands and tell me to pray to the Blessed Virgin, and they'll all be well again in no time. Oh, let me see. What did I come in here to find? It's terrible how absent-minded I've become. I'm always dreaming and forgetting. What is she carrying, Edmund? Her wedding gown, I suppose. Christ! Mary, isn't it bad enough? Here, let me take it, dear. We we'll only step on it and tear it and get it dirty, dragging it on the floor. Then you'd be sorry afterwards. Thank you. You are very kind. It's a wedding gown. It's very lovely, isn't it? I remember now. I found it in the attic hidden in a trunk. But I don't know what I wanted it for. I'm going to be a nun. That is, if I can only find... What is it I'm looking for? Something I lost. Mary. She doesn't seem to hear him. He gives up helplessly, shrinking into himself, even his defensive drunkenness taken from him, leaving him sick and sober. He sinks back on his chair, holding the wedding gown in his arms with an unconscious, clumsy, protective gentleness. It's no good, Baba. Let us rise up and part. She will not know. Let us go seaward as the great winds go. Full of blown sand and foam, what help is here? There is no help, for all these things are so. And all the world is bitter as a tear. And how these things are, though yet strove to show, she would not know. Something I miss terribly. I can't be altogether lost. Mama! Hell, what's the use? It's no good. Let us go hence, my songs she will not hear. Let us go hence together without fear. Keep silence now, for singing time is over, and over all old things and all things dear. She loves not you nor me as all we love her. Yea, though we sang as angels in her ear, she would not hear. Something, something 
thing I mean terribly. I remember when I had it, I was never lonely, never afraid. I can't have lost it forever. I would die if I thought that. Because then there would be no hope. She moves like a sleepwalker around the back of Jamie's chair, then forward towards left front, passing behind Edmund. Mama, it isn't a summer cold. I've got consumption. For a second, he seems to have broken through to her. She trembles and her expression becomes terrified. She calls distractedly as if giving a command to herself. No! You must not try to touch me. You must not try to hold me. It isn't right when I'm hoping to be a nun. He lets his hand drop from her arm. She moves left to the front end of the sofa beneath the windows and sits down, facing front, her hands folded in her lap in a demure, schoolgirlish pose. You damn fool. It's no good. Let us go hence, go hence, she will not see. Sing all once more together, surely she, she too, remembering days and words that were, will turn a little toward us, sighing, but we, we are hence, we are gone, as though we had not been there, nay, and though all men seeing had pity on me, she would not see. Oh, we're fools to pay any attention. It's the damned poison. But I've never known her to drown herself in it as deep as this. Pass me that bottle, Jamie, and stop reciting that damned morbid poetry. I won't have it in my house. Jamie pushes the bottle towards him. He pours a drink without disarranging the wedding gown he holds carefully over his other arm in his lap and shoves the bottle back. Jamie pours his and passes the bottle to Edmund, who, in turn, pours one. Tyrone lifts his glass and his sons follow suit mechanically, but before they can drink, Mary speaks, and they slowly lower their drinks to the table, forgetting them. I had a talk with Mother Elizabeth. She's so sweet and good, saint on earth. I love her dearly. Maybe sinful of me, but I love her better than my own mother, <laughs> because she always understands, even before you say a word. My kind blue eyes look right into your heart. It may keep any secrets from her. You shouldn't deceive her, even if you were mean enough to want to. Well, all the same, I don't think she was so understanding this time. I told her that I wanted to be a nun. I explained how sure I was of my vocation, but I had prayed to the Blessed Virgin to make me sure, to find me worthy. I told Mother I had a true vision when I was praying at the shrine of Our Lady of Lords on the little island in the lake. I said I knew as surely as I knew I was kneeling there, that the Blessed Virgin had smiled and blessed me with her consent. But Mother Elizabeth told me I must be more sure than that even, that I must prove it, that it wasn't simply my imagination. She said, if I was so sure, then I wouldn't mind putting myself to a test by going home after I graduated and living as other girls live, going out to parties and dances and enjoying myself. And, then if after a year or two, I still felt sure I could come back to see her and we would talk it over again. I never dreamed Holy Mother would give me such advice. I was really shocked. I said, of course, I would do anything she suggested, but I knew it was simply a waste of time. After I left her, I felt all mixed up. So I went to the shrine and I prayed to the Blessed Virgin and found peace again because I knew she heard my prayer, would always love me and see no harm ever came of me so long as I never lost my faith in her. That was the winter of my senior year. Then in the spring, something happened to me. Yes, I remember. I fell in love with James Tyrone and was so happy for a time. She stares before her in a sad dream. Tyrone stirs in his chair. Edmund and Jamie remain motionless. Curtain.